no, shit, shit, we've got it wrong, we've got it wrong, we've got it wrong. 60 seconds left. I can't believe I hit Barry Norman in the balls of a bag of phlegm. So the very first time I did a live TV show where I was the main host was genuinely one of the worst moments looking back ever. If you're a female presenter, it was about, will she get a kit off and do the lads mags? He asked me to remove my jacket and take my top off. And I was so scared. And as the floor manager was counting us down, we're alive in five, four. Mm -hmm. I, I started to see stars and I'm like, oh, oh my God, I, I can't see. I couldn't see. I had gone so dizzy with excitement or nerves. And she's got Lawrence Fishburne. And I'm like talking absolute bollocks to him. Going, hi Lawrence, blah, 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 blah. It said some utter nonsense. And he, mm -hmm. he starts talking about 9-11 and he did it on purpose. And you could tell he was just like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ruin this interview for you. And I was like, that's okay, bye. And somebody on the inside phoned me and said, you know that you, could get compensation yeah. for this. But the chances are, if you did, you'd probably never work in TV again. Steve-O swore, so we had to apologize. And then and then the power's gone, and now poor Leatherface, he's sat there, he's come all the way over from America, plugging something, and doesn't even get interviewed. I can't do this and be a mom to a young kid at the same time. And I've never been so intimidated, scared, nervous, excited in my life okay. before. I've, I've got an agent. And then I started working. And that was it. Da -da! I was on telly quite a bit. And I kind of thought, I was going to be the same with acting. If you've got a dream and you want to do it, do it. Give it a go. Hi, I'm Andrea Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is my friend from Working Actors Studio. She's a TV presenter. She's an actress. She's a voiceover actress. Uh, she's a writer. She's a mother. Jane Sharp. Somehow make me sound like a superhero. <laughs> like, wow, really? Am I all those things? Am I though? <laughs> we'll find out. Look, let's go straight into it. You are from really small village. Mm -hmm. It's called? Durka. Yeah. Sexy sounding name, right? It's very up north, right? Can I tell you? So Durka, yeah. where I'm from, yeah. yeah, teeny tiny village in Wakefield in Yorkshire. And it's in the Doomsday Book. The actual name Durka, it used to be known in the Doomsday Book as Dirt Cart. Okay. Told you it was glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> and you studied uh, film and media, right? Mm hmm. So how did this happen? Why? you went to study that and what was your plan after? Was there any plan? <laughs> I don't think that's ever a plan, is there Andre? Mm. So for years growing up, I always wanted to do something a little bit entertainery. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't know what, I didn't, I, and especially when you come from Wakefield, that's not really what you do. Mm. There's, there's, there wasn't really back then any options for doing that kind of stuff. And my mum, was constantly like, you should be a teacher, be a teacher because and I'm like, I can barely do maths. Mm -hmm. And she was like, be a teacher because think of all the summer holidays you get. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to be a teacher. So I used to do things like amateur dramatics. There was um, this group that I was in called the Kids from Crick mm -hmm. and it was amateur dramatics. And we used to meet every Monday and do all these songs, do performances and stuff like that. And I loved it. I really, really did. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, I know I want to entertain, but I don't know how I make that happen. And then one day at school, you know, before when you're picking your options for GCSEs, I was going for this presentation on hair and beauty mm -hmm. because I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. And as I was walking down the corridor to go talk to the woman who'd come into our school about, you know, doing this as, a, as an option, the head teacher stopped me in the queue of people and he went, what do you think you're doing? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to the, the hair and beauty meeting. And he went, no, you're not, go back to class. And I was like, whoa, 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 what? 
But he said to me, he goes, this, this is not what you want to do. I yeah. don't know why you're even entertaining the idea. This mm. is not what you, what you want to do. Go back. And I've never been so grateful. That was like, mm-hmm. I didn't think he knew me very well. And it turns out he really did. So I didn't go and do that. And instead I went to, when, you know, when, you go to, when you're 16 and you go to college. So I went and looked at this media course and it was so exciting. And I was like, okay, well, I can make films. That sounds brilliant. Did that, then went to uni, did the same thing. Where was it? The university was at Hull. Uh-huh. Again, I've gone from glamour to more glamour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to Hull, Andre. No. Um, so yeah, I, I studied film and media studies there and it was okay. Yeah. But I kept thinking, I want to be on the other side of the camera. That's all I knew. I well, thought, can you, sorry to, to interrupt you, but can, can you explain to me what do you study when you study film and media? It's making films. Yeah. Well, you sort of... Well, you, You sort of cover everything, to Mm -hmm. be honest. So it's like publications, so you do magazines and things like that, and Mm -hmm. whether you're good at design or whether you like to do radio or whether you want to do film. And I quickly realized that radio and and magazines, not kind of my thing, Mm -hmm. Um, but film was, film and TV, well, they called it TV studio. So film and TV studio was the two that I settled on and really enjoyed. But I was always in front of the camera. Like if like, oh, we need somebody to be in front of the camera. And I'd be like, yeah. okay. <laughs> Where's it coming from? Where what, sorry? Like your desire to perform and to be in, in, like basically being in front of the camera is being in the center of attention, I guess. Do you know what? And this is something that I've had to try and think about and deal with a lot recently because oh, again, when I was younger, I was always told stop showing off, stop showing off. Mm-hmm. And I actually, weirdly, for a long time, have felt so much shame about wanting to Mm. perform. And it's weird. I constantly have to fight that. And it's just been sort of programmed into me from being very, very young. Mm. Oh, look, she's showing off. Oh, look, she wants attention. Stop showing off. Stop doing that. Telling a kid to stop showing off, I think, is one of the most stifling things you can possibly do. Like, let them shine, let them show off, let them vent, let them do whatever. Mm-hmm. Just let them be, just let them be. Um, so I sort of fought it for a long time. And eventually it was like, okay, no, I actually, I do think I, I want to be on telly. I want to be in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. So I finished uni and I just knew that I had to move away from Wakefield. I mm-hmm. couldn't go back had to move to London and I applied for any job, any jobs in TV. And the first job I got was as a runner on family affairs. So this is going back 25-ish years. Can you explain what a runner is for people who don't know? Oh, I Because was a, I, I know sorry. everything. <laughs> so I was a general dog's body. <laughs> I know a runner on American TV shows is very different to over here. You're pretty much the producer over there if you're a runner. But over here, you are like, I need some water. Can you go get me that? The post needs taking to the post box. Can you go deal with that? There's some crap on the floor. Can you clean Mm. that up? So I got a job doing that on Family Affairs, which was this soap opera on Channel 5. We had an office runner and a studio runner. Mm. And I was the office runner, so I didn't even get to do the fun stuff on set. I was in the office. So it was all together. They were all next to each other. Um, But I was doing, you know, post and stuff like that. And then one of the jobs that I had was, um, so you know the big water coolers, the big water bottles that you put in the water coolers? My job was to distribute those all around set on my own. They were massive. Those are heavy. So heavy. And we didn't have a trolley, didn't have anything. Oh, wow. And one day when I went to get one of the bottles from, they were all kept under the stairs, put my back out. And yeah. I was, they found me under the stairs. I'd been there for about half an hour until somebody actually came because I'd just put my back out completely. Oh. And they sent for an ambulance and that was it. I never worked there again. I couldn't go back. I was out of work for about four months. I'm pretty sure that nowadays if you would have like, if you would get such an injury anywhere on like, I don't know, BBC, ITV or anywhere, like you would be paid off like some medical insurance for sure. Well, <laughs> I was very young. Grown up Jane Mm -hmm. knows better. Mm -hmm. Young Jane didn't. And somebody on the inside phoned me and said, you know that you 
could get compensation yeah. for this. And I was like, okay. And they said, but the chances are if you did, you'd probably never work in TV again. <sighs> and I'm like that, okay, so I'm definitely not going to do that then. Mm. So that was really, I should have done because it's affected my entire life since then. So you live and learn, right? Yeah. But yeah, I wanted to co continue working in TV and it wasn't just about, I'm going to sue that company. I, I wasn't thinking that way yeah. anyway. But yeah, so I, that, was, that was my first job. Did studying film and, and media help you a lot, like at all, to get this first job or in general in your career? It didn't help me get the job. It made me want to work in the industry. That okay. was a good thing. So it definitely had its, its bonuses. However, when I first started on Family Affairs on that very first day as a 22-year-old runner, mm -hmm. the girl that I was working alongside was so much more like higher than me in the industry because she'd started as a runner at the age of 17. She didn't go mm -hmm. to university. She yeah. took a different, a different route. And she just started working on set really, really young and worked her way up and worked her way up. So she was higher than me without doing any of that stuff. But, but like I say, it gave me the drive to want to yeah. work in TV. And I thought, yeah, if this is like playing at it, imagine what the real thing's like. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. But I guess I still just always wanted to be mm -hmm. in front of camera. Anyway, so then I put my back out, mm -hmm. was out of work for a while. But how everything sort of happens for a reason, I then saw a job advertised in a newspaper. And can you imagine that? An, actual newspaper i can still remember those yes <laughs> right um back then there was a tv channel called live tv mm -hmm. and it was kind of a cult classic it was on cable mm -hmm. but everybody knew about it they had all these things like the news bunny topless darts all these all, all things. topless darts <laughs> to be fair there was daytime live tv yeah of course and nighttime live tv I did daytime. Everybody always used to say to me all the time that when I told them that I worked, at, when I ever told people that I worked at Live TV, they go, oh yeah, did you do topless darts? No. <laughs> I did a show called Agony, um, which was this Agony Ant show. And it was all such bullshit. <laughs> we just made up fabricated stories because I used to write them as well. And I was, I was researching on the show too. I had to do the whole lot make up these like dear whatever dear agony team um my boyfriend like has cheated on me and such and such blah 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 blah. we'd film the actual dilemma and then it'd come back to us in the studio and there'd be me and there's a girl called judy shikoni who she's gone on she was an actress and she's done like she was in like maleficent and twilight and all that kind of stuff anyway we just used to our job was to sit and row on a sofa. <laughs> I think this. Well, you're wrong. I think that. That was my job there. So I worked there for a while and it was, I made some of the best friends ever yeah. working at live TV because we were all working for peanuts, working all hours God sends. There was, it was, it was just a really fun environment though. Like we all just wanted to be there mm. and really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a, I'm, and I'm still, like really close friends with a load of them that, that work there, which I think is quite rare these days. What was the process of getting there, getting the job? Oh my God, I can't remember. <laughs> I think I will have, because I wouldn't have emailed them. Yeah. I don't know, Andre. It's a <laughs> long time ago. How did you apply for jobs back then? I probably wrote a letter. Mm -hmm. I will have written a letter because I didn't even have like, a typewriter, let alone a laptop, mm -hmm. I will have handwritten a letter and posted it. Can you imagine? I barely, I barely. Oh, I've got to tell you this, talking about posting things. Mm -hmm. So I started working there as a presenter and that got me, you know, got me rolling basically. Yeah. And I then needed an agent. So back then, what we used to have to do was again, handwrite a letter. Oh my God. <laughs> I would put my VHS showreel in a box and you had to kind of like try and stand out to these people. Mm -hmm. They must have hated me. I put a VHS tape in a box with a photograph, pack it full of glitter. 
so that when they open it, I thought that was a really good idea. Like, well, they'll remember me. Yes, because they're covered in bloody glitter. <laughs> Who wants that? I'm surprised anyone took me on. Like, that's a great idea. That'll get them to notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure, and you know, someone, someone picked me up, picked you up. So uh. yeah, well, I, I got, I got signed with a guy called Michael Joyce at a an agency called Silver Fox, and they were really big. They had like, especially for me, back then, they had so many big name presenters, people I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So it was a big thing to to yeah. get in with them. Um, and I loved it. They were so good. They mm. were so so good. It was proper old school back then. Mm. Well, what do you mean by old school? I don't know. It was just, it really was completely different to now. Everything seemed so much more personal and everybody, there was no, nothing was digital. Mm -hmm. Everything was done in a meeting. Everything would be like, yeah. do I want to hire this person? I don't know. Let me take her out for coffee. Let's have lunch. Let's talk face to face. Mm -hmm. And then you as a person got to charm that person that mm. you were talking to. I remember going in for a job at, it was at the Disney Channel as a presenter at Disney. And I was full of like, it, it was a bad cold. I'll never say it was the flu, but it was like a really bad cold. I shouldn't have gone in. And again, one of those things thinking, this is a great idea. I went in <laughs> sneezing, coughing, and at the end I was like, well, if I pass on my germs to you, at least you'll remember me. <laughs> <laughs> and he just looked, he was just like, oh my God, I don't want to catch a disgusting germ. Uh, no, Get but out that, of my office. bold. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, yeah, things were just done differently. But you I, didn't I get really, it. I quite liked it. I didn't get that one, no. <laughs> but I had a good hit rate. When I, was, when I was working as a presenter, I was always working. Yeah. I was always working. So... Same channel or? No, uh. all different channels. I, I've done pretty much all the, I've done BBC One, Two, ITV, ITV Two. Did I do anything on Channel Four? Not that I can remember, but Channel Five, I did as well. I did, and then loads of the mm. digital channels, you know. What, what does it mean? TV presenter? Is there like different kinds of presenters? Is it like, what, what, what the term means? Well, again, this has all changed massively. It changed as I was a presenter. When the first ever Big Brother came out, do, do you remember that? I wasn't here. So when the very first Big Brother came out, everything changed. Mm -hmm. And suddenly off the back of the first Big Brother where these People who'd been literally just plucked off the street mm -hmm. were suddenly famous. I remember my agent saying to me, this is getting really frustrating now because all people want are these people of Big Brother to present their shows. And it's just gone that way and snowballed so much more since. So now, back then, there's me, there's a handful of us that would be hired to present these TV shows. And we weren't, we were, we weren't famous, but we were names for being presenters. Yeah. Now it's, well, what have they been in? Mm -hmm. If they're going to present this show, I need to know that they're famous for something first. Oh, they were on Love Island. Great, let's hire them. It's like, that doesn't mean you can present. Mm -hmm. That means doesn't mean you can count to time. You can present to time. There's a lot of things that are included, especially in doing live TV. And, and it was a shame that that all sort of changed mm. things. And then unless you were a massive name, mm. you kind of got... <laughs> what are the skills that you need to have to be a presenter? Back then, it was definitely more just about your personality and mm -hmm. if you were a people person. Yeah. And a lot of the shows that I presented, they were all such silly, silly shows that you just had to have a laugh. Yeah. Oh, and also back then, let's not forget, with the whole different times and everything, if you were a female presenter, it was about, will she get a kit off and do the lads mags? That's, mm -hmm. That doesn't happen now. Back then, it was almost like you are expected to do these poses and these shoots in these magazines, you, like FHM and, and Loaded and all those kind of magazines, that all sort of came with it. It's like, will you pose in a swimsuit? Will you do this? Will you do that? And it's like, yeah, 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 of course. I'll do anything to be on telly. <laughs> so, which was the essence of another show that I used to present called Would You Could You? Mm -hmm. And I actually have like a little 
something that I want I want to quote if you don't uh, mind. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to this. <laughs> so basically, I found this uh, on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's public. <laughs> okay. It's on your Instagram. Okay. And there is this basically magazine with you and another lady. You're like wearing swimsuits mm -hmm. and you're bathing in beans, as I understand. I mean, Andre, haven't we all put on a swimsuit and got in a bath of beans in our I, lifetime? <laughs> this morning, yes, but you know, not publicly. <laughs> <laughs> but so, and there, sorry, like, and I, I want to quote what you wrote. Yes. So there is a caption from you. Every now and again, something <laughs> pops up on Facebook to remind me of the very questionable life choices I've made. <laughs> Here we are plugging our TV show by bathing in beans. Sure. So is it just a pun, or you like really think it was poor life choice? And were there other life? Poor life choices that you think you had that you could talk about and you think people should avoid doing? No, to be honest, it was all fun. It yeah. was all fun. Like, we had such a laugh film in that show. Um, so, yeah, it was called Would You Could You? Mm -hmm. And it was on ITV2. And it was based off a segment from another show called The Word, which was on years ago, which was another massive cult classic. And that segment on The Word was called I'll Do Anything to Be on TV. Mm hmm. So we had to go around. We, we went abroad to film it. We were filming it all over the UK. And, and the whole point was going up to random people saying, would you do X, Y, and Z for this amount of money? And nine times out of 10, people always said yes. <laughs> so doing stupid things. So this was part of the promotion. So when you are hired to do a TV show, mm -hmm. you are expected to do whatever promotion they want. And that's all in the contract. Mm -hmm. Whether that's putting on a bikini and sitting in a bath of beans or, you know, <laughs> any, something any, not so classy. <laughs> anything you regret? Do you know what? No. I've never done anything that has made me feel so bad with regret. Mm -hmm. I think everything has brought me to a point where I'm meant to be. Yeah. And I'm very much a believer that if I didn't do one of those things, maybe I wouldn't have my children now. You know what I mean? It's like you can't regret a single yeah. moment of your life. Yeah. You've done it, you've learned from it, or maybe you haven't learned from it and you've done it again. Yeah. You will get to a point where eventually it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter unless you've murdered somebody. That's not a good thing to do. <laughs> but you know what I mean? And if it's something you've gone career-wise, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Or a relationship, oh, maybe you shouldn't have done that. It's like you move on. Mm -hmm. Or like I said, or you don't. Interestingly, just just right now, I, I was on the way here from London, and I was listening to this uh, diary of the CEU podcast that they were talking about regret in careers, and they were saying like, if you're a successful person, if you consider yourself successful, you can't regret anything no. that you did because everything that you did led led you to be here and be the person you are right now. Absolutely. If you wouldn't do something, you wouldn't be here. Probably, no. maybe. So you can't, yeah, and I, I agree with that. I yeah, agree with it's that. It's that butterfly effect, isn't mm -hmm. it? Everything has an effect on something else. So yeah. you've got to embrace it, you know, and us as being parents, we realize that we've got to guide our children. They're going to be constantly making mistakes. Oh but it's God. also trying to tell them that mistakes are fine and it is good to fail. It's good to fail or it's mm -hmm. good to not do so well or it's good yeah. to make the wrong decision. As long as you do learn something from it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Do you think that the, the industry really like changed a lot since you started? Yeah, massively. massively. Because well, because right now when you're saying things like, and I remember those shows as well, but like back in Latvia, I was we were watching I think Russian TV and Latvian TV, and there were shows like that, like will like you'll be on telly for doing something stupid, jumping in the yeah. in the you know spill I don't know like in, in in water or whatever, like just in dirt, and we'll give you a little <laughs> bit of money, and you're yeah. on TV, and people were doing this. Do you, I, it feels like right now. Being on TV back then meant something. I think right now being on TV doesn't mean shit. Well, everything's changed, though, hasn't it? Because now people are doing those kind of pranks or whatever. They're doing them online instead. So on TV, YouTube. TV has completely changed shape yeah. because now we want things instantly. We're not going to watch a whole show on people doing silly things for cash. We're going to watch it in... 10, 20, 30 seconds and go, Haha, that's funny, yeah. on to the next, yeah. on to the next, on to the next. We don't have the capacity anymore to be patient enough to watch a show like that. There's no we can. Well, yeah. The younger generation, I think, yeah. they don't. Oh, but 
then again, I, I'm i still a little impatient now. It has made me impatient. Yeah. I'm like, I want it I want it quick and I want yeah. it exactly tailored to my needs. Mm-hmm. That's something that's changed. Yeah. Now when we're on Instagram or YouTube or anything, everything's so finely tuned to our algorithm yeah. that it, it feeds us what we want to watch. Yeah. TV can't really compete with that anymore. So it's... Yeah, completely changed. However, you know, we, we still need to watch our dramas and things like that. But yeah, I think, but now you know, even the dramas are kind of compressed into this like thirty second videos. Yeah, it's 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 insane. Like people and, want just quicker, yeah. shorter, instant gratification. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, like it's not. It is like an instant dopamine, but at the same yeah. time doesn't have as much kind of how do you say like satisfaction because like mm-hmm. if you're watching like a, or reading a long book or you're watching like a full movie yeah. or something like that's like a huge story with more details that you have more satisfaction mm-hmm. with so i think hopefully long format will not be gone no i don't think it will. forever i don't think but it will. it's very interesting i was uh, i was watching this very successful girl i don't remember her name but she an influencer she basically does shirts on yeah. on youtube mm. and she makes a lot of money with it she's very young she's like 18 or like 19 or right now and damn she, these young successful rich people and then <laughs> that, that's the thing like she kind of cracked the code she knows how to make very very short story actual story mm. and how to make who can in, in the beginning how to it does like it, it's it's whole science and she says like I know that when I started doing long form videos, there were comments from people who were my subscribers, very young people, like, yeah. I mean, like, you yeah. know, teens and other teens, under teens. And they had no idea that YouTube had long, sh- long, long form videos. They, th- mm-hmm. they, they thought that shorts, that's all YouTube does. Yeah. Can you imagine? Like, yeah. it's just, they live in a completely different world. <laughs> yeah, completely, completely. Yeah, I, um, so I had, quite a bit of success with stuff online back when there was a an app called vine yeah do you remember, remember vine? yeah i i never i was never a user but i know what it is is this very like what eight seconds six short, seconds six, six seconds six yeah. seconds so vine came out it was owned by twitter mm-hmm. and vine came out at a point where i was very single <laughs> very bored and I loved it and I really took to it and it was quite a challenge to do something. I was like, you can do what you want with it. But I did little funny shorts um, and that's quite hard to do in six seconds. It's yes. But there was a method and there's a way mm-hmm. and if you cracked it, you were successful. And I got quite successful when a certain young Mr. Harry Styles started following me. I, I for some reason, he started following me. Yeah. And then because of that, people see who Harry's following and then they all follow. And I used to get messages all the time going, how do you know Harry? I'm like, I don't know him. Leave me alone. Um, Anyway, the Vine stuff really took off. And off the back of that, I got so much work out of it. It was amazing. It was weird. I didn't understand how I'd somehow forged this kind of weird career that I didn't think could ever be a career. And I started oh, wow. being approached by brands yeah. to do loads of different filming, loads of things. I got to do lots of comedy stuff. I worked with Garnier. I worked with L'Oreal. I worked with, oh, I did stuff for the Olympics. I did all sorts of stuff where companies would just come and go, hi, will you do this for us? Do a video about this. Do a video well, about this. But when they approached you, did they ask you to write the script? Or I had to do were... the lot. Yeah. I used to, yeah, I had to do the lot. Um, it was because they basically they came to you for your personality yeah but sometimes though then it got a little bit complicated sometimes because big brands would get me in and there'd be all these people sat around this big table in this boardroom Mm. and i'd be like what's going on here this is weird i do my vines at home on my own in my house um when my daughter's gone to school or whatever and they'd be like 15 people sat around a table going, right, so we've had some ideas. We're thinking this, 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 and this. And everything was so unrealistic. Because I'm like, guys, do you know you've got six seconds? You're wanting mm-hmm. to do an entire movie here yeah. in six seconds. Um, no, I've been on, in those and meetings. Then, they'd go, then they'd say to you sometimes, can you storyboard something for me? Can you do this? And I was like, rather than me storyboarding something for you, why don't I just make it? Because it's six seconds. Because it's six <laughs> seconds. And then if you don't like it, 
I'll do it again. <laughs> more like you want it. Yeah. So it was quite, I'd be just like, oh, it's all got really complicated now. And Committees. Yeah, and everybody needs to, uh, yeah, everything's then got to be cleared. Whereas when I was doing stuff for my own account, it's like, do what you want, who yeah. cares? When other brands and, you know, like lawyers are involved and stuff, you're like, oh my God, this is actually really taking all the fun out of it. Yeah. And um, when I sort of fell out of love with Vine and all that kind of stuff, was when I was then pregnant with Piper, my youngest. So I'd already kind of gone off it a little bit because I'd suddenly had Ross and I was distracted with all, all this, mm -hmm. you know, new relationship and everything. And then I fell pregnant with Piper and I was approached by a brand, a, 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 a drinks brand, and they came to me saying, we really want you to do this. And I was like, well, can you tell me what the drink is? Oh, no, 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 we can't at the moment um, because of whatever. And I'm like, you're gonna have to tell me because I'm pregnant. So is it an alcoholic drink mm -hmm. or what? Because I'm six, seven months pregnant. Um, and they were saying, oh yeah, it's alcohol, but don't worry about that. You can just film yourself from the chest upwards. And I was like, no, my followers know I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. I I've talked about it. You I said, no one's going to look good out of this. Yeah. I'm going to look terrible. And you as a brand aren't going to look good approaching a pregnant woman to promote your, your drink. Yeah. That was where I kind of was like, no, I'm all right. I'm good. I can't do that. Mm. And then it just went off the boil. And like I said, then lockdown sort of happened. And I thought, oh, I can make longer funny videos mm. now on Instagram. And then over lockdown as well, I continued it as we all sort of found a little niche, didn't we, in lockdown. Um, yeah, and I had, yeah, my niche was getting fat and miserable. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> but I had quite a bit of success with that. Why did you stop? Um, so here's the thing. You question yourself a lot. A lot of times... Yeah, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I do. The amount of times, though, that you put stuff out there... But this is the same as being an actor, isn't it? But like when you put your stuff out there, it's then up for everybody and their dog to go, that's shit, that's not funny, who, does she, who is she? Why did, and you kind of go, I don't, I don't need that. Mm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need that at all. Did, did you have to, to deal with some kind of negative reaction to what you were doing? To be honest, I was lucky. And most of the people that followed me or replied to my stories, I, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, it was always really good. You'd get the odd one yeah. or two people going, mm. no, whatever. Um, but I got like retweeted by like Mini Driver and I loved it. She retweeted one of my videos. Mm. It was the man the um, beauty salon, hair salon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm doing that because you know what I mean. <laughs> um, it was that video and she retweeted it or posted it on Instagram. And then in the likes, Taika Waititi mm. liked it. Mm. And I'm like, Today's a good day. Mm -hmm. I really, it was such a lovely thing to see. Of course, yeah. But then when you make something that's successful, the pressure's on to make another. Mm -hmm. And I would have people almost like banging down my dog going, when are you making another video? When's your next video out? And I'm like, I don't know, oh, I've got a baby really? to feed and I've got stuff to do. And then that pressure of, shit, I've got to be funny again. And, I, I, and you just draw a blank and I, I can't do it. Yeah. And then, yeah, it, it all got to stress me out. I got really anxious about the whole stuff. Interesting, because mm. there's like, I don't understand you could put pressure on yourself after some successful work project, yeah. you know, but like if it's just for fun, if you're just doing some fun videos on your own channel and it still can get you. Because people, your followers, feel like they not own you, but they're they a part of this you. journey. Yes. They know you and they're like, and they mean well. If somebody's saying to you, yeah, we want another video, make another mm -hmm. video. That's a nice thing. But to me, sat at home going, oh, I don't know how to mm -hmm. do it. I don't know what to do. It, it became really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I got really quite, yeah. I just had to distance myself from it for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't like that side of it. Interesting. I'm like, give me a writer, give me something else. I'll make mm -hmm. your stuff, but just know the pressure of doing it myself now is weird. Going back to the times when you had like a writer and you were doing live shows, how did that like, when you started your career as a presenter, like did you start from live, live shows straight um, away? So no, no, actually, no. So even live TV, which is called live TV, not all of it was live mm -hmm. and that was pre-recorded. Um, what was my first live TV show? It was live with Christian O'Connell. 
Yes, mm -hmm. on Channel 5. And it was, in, we filmed it in King's Cross, in this studio there above a pub. And it was, the company was run by Chris Evans. And it was very sort of TFI. Chris Evans, the DJ, not the actor. Yeah. No. <laughs> See, again, <laughs> showing my age. But yeah, Chris Evans, the DJ. So back then, yeah. big media mogul, kind of did all the TV stuff and all that kind of thing. Um, and then he set up a company called UMTV. Mm -hmm. And he made TV shows, and this was one of them. So a guy called Christian O'Connell, who was a breakfast pre show presenter over here on Radio X years back, he now is huge in Australia. Um, and I was his sidekick. And yeah, we went live every single night at five o'clock in, um, in this pub, above a pub. We had a live studio audience, celebrity guests every single night, and... It was brilliant. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun. Like, is it so much stress? Yes, but it's brilliant stress. Yeah. So, Andre, I remember the very first night, my very, very first, you're live on national television. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. And I had to sit on a stool, like a bar stool, behind a desk. And as the floor manager was counting us down, we're alive in five, four. Mm -hmm. I. I started to see stars and I'm like, oh, oh my God, I've, I can't see. I couldn't see. I had gone so dizzy with excitement or nerves. Or both. I remember, because I got my feet hooked into, the, how I used to sit, I'd, I'd hook my feet around the chair. And I remember thinking, preparing myself, unhook your feet, because if you faint, you need to be able to just fall easily. And I just, that was, as we were coming live on air, oh Christian starts speaking, I'm like, I can't see, and I'm about to fall off this chair <laughs> in front of all these people. So, and it didn't really get any easier. And it felt like, I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? Every night was like actual torture. But at the end of it, you are so full of adrenaline yeah. and it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And the best thing ever about live TV is once you've finished, you've finished. Yeah. There's no pickups, no, we need to do that again, no cutaways, no nothing. Mm -hmm. You're done and you go to the pub, which we were already filming yeah. in. So it was <laughs> perfect. Like, honestly, give me live TV any day of the week. Then not long after that, I went to do a show called Live from Studio 5, which was on Channel 5, and it was like the, another celebrity kind of like, not a panel show, because it was just like three of us presenting it. And then we'd have celebrity guests and VTs and things like that. And well, like, so you were presenting, like, did you have to like to, to do some interviews with the celebrities or talk to them? Or you yeah, were, yeah, yeah, all sorts. Everything um, was prepared for you, like, or how much did you have to impro improvise? Um, it was all prepared in, in terms of it was in the script. In terms of interviewing people, you had a list of questions in your head, much as you will have a list of questions in your head right now. But you kind of made it up as you went along because you went with the vibe and the flow of the yeah. person that you're talking to. That's how it works, isn't mm -hmm. it? So, yeah, I, and I liked that. And sometimes, oh my God, one of the worst experiences I had, most of the time, celebrities were brilliant because obviously they had things to plug. They don't want to come across looking like a massive bell. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes... They didn't seem to care. <laughs> and on, on one of the things they'd sent me down for the whole of the live show to the red carpet on Leicester Square of the premiere of The Matrix, mm -hmm. Lawrence Fishburne, that was it, came down the red carpet. And I'm there with the live cameras directly, you know, feeding into mm -hmm. our show. And they're like, we're going to go down there now to Jane, who's on the red carpet. And she's got Lawrence Fishburne. And I'm like, talking absolute bollocks to him going, hi Lawrence, blah, 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 said some utter nonsense. And he, he 100% he did this to kind of sideswipe me. Mm -hmm. He starts talking about 9-11. And that was not the time or the place to, mm -hmm. because this was clearly a, and he just went so serious and started talking. Wait, Matrix, <laughs> which Matrix was it? It wasn't the first one. Definitely Maybe wasn't the, the first one. one. Maybe the second one. Because, yeah, it came out way before 9-11. Yeah, right, yeah, it must have been the second one. And I stood there going, okay, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> and just wanted the ground to swallow me up mm -hmm. because I had nothing. Oh, I was yeah. there expecting to do some 
absolute stupid, fluffy, candy floss yeah. chat. And I yeah. thought he'd give the same back and he didn't. And he did it on purpose. And you could tell he was just like, I'm just going to, I'm going to ruin this interview for you. And I was like, that. okay, bye. Why? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I had so many, like people actually wrote into the show going, why did he do that? That felt a bit mean. Like he was having, it was yeah. weird. It was really, really weird. But you have to be prepared for that. I was very young and I really wasn't I don't know. There, like, there are things that you can prepare yourself to like for whatever, but there are like, there are cases when they, you just like being caught off guard completely yeah. and just like, well, I couldn't have, predicted that no anyway no no um so that wasn't as much fun mm. um but still the whole it was fun to be down there mm. doing all that stuff but mm. fighting your way amongst all these other journalists to like try and get mm. people talking into your microphone so that like you, you you didn't only do like the studio stuff you were like you know out in the field in a way as well, yes like, yes carpets as well. i used to do quite a few of the junkets for films as, mm. as well which was really fun um, and I got to interview um, Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. And that was another one that was actually quite weird. So I spent the afternoon in a hotel room with him where they do the whole, you know, chats like this. And he was so charming. He was amazing. I he answered imagine. all the questions that, but then later on I had to do the same kind of thing, but on the red carpet mm -hmm. as he was going into the, into the um, premiere yeah. and he was giving nothing to mm -hmm. anyone. And then, and I was a bit like, well, that's mean, that's rude. And then you kind of think, He's had a day of this. I yeah. interviewed him like nine hours ago asking all this nonsense and he's, he's had a day. I was one of a hundred people yeah. asking him questions. So you're like, fair enough. But what would you prefer? Uh, studio filming or those red carpets being a field? Or studio yeah. was always fun. Live studio was great. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the day? Of your like, for example, let, like let's take maybe think of your favorite live show that you did. What would be the day on set for you? Okay, when you say think of your favorite live show, <laughs> I've immediately thought of the worst. <laughs> let's, let's go but for this the worst. Was, no, this was actually this was episode one of Live with Christian O'Connell, and it's always really quite scary. Our first guest was a guy called Steve-O from Jackass, mm -hmm. and. Bear in mind, we're going out live at 5 p.m. So pre-watershed, we'd been on for like a few seconds and already he starts swearing really bad. And it's like, oh gosh, no, it's fine. You're covering up, apologizing for everything he's saying. Something else happened really bad. We had the leather face from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. He was our big guest waiting to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. And we went live off air. Like we, we crashed, the, 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 the signal went. And this was like 10, 15 minutes in. <laughs> so we ended up just like with, with nothing. I think the power went all sorts and then we just went off air. Yeah. And it's like, that was our first show. Yeah. We, Steve-O swore, so we had to apologize. <laughs> and, then, and then the power's gone and now poor Leatherface, he's sat there, he's come all the way over from America plugging something and doesn't <laughs> even get interviewed. So that was, <laughs> that was really oh. cool. But it got better from that point on. What would be your day on set, on live show? We would, so if we went on air at five, was it five? We didn't, we went on air at seven. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. I think we'd get in there, I, I would get in there two, two and a half hours before we went on. And we'd all have a big meeting first. And the producers would go through, right, this is what's going to be on the show today. They'd take us through the script, mm -hmm. through the different segments. Christian, you're going to do this. Jane, you're going to do this. Then we're going to, then going to cut to this. All that kind of stuff. So we were familiar with our scripts. Um, and then probably get something to eat. Then I would go to makeup, which was the best thing ever, and have someone put loads of makeup on me. And then to wardrobe, they'd dress me, and then take me down to set. And that was it. Mm -hmm. It was really like... And then once you'd done it a few times, your your call time started getting closer to actually yeah. being on air. You'd be like, yeah, we'll just rock up and we'd go through it a little bit slap some makeup on, get on set, mm. and then all to the pub afterwards. Yeah. And uh, like, you do have scripts, but it's all teleprompter? It was mainly teleprompter, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we... Um, Which is a skill in, on itself, right? Yeah, I, I, the, the pressure wasn't on me in that show. It was Christian's name above the door, mm -hmm. so it all fell on him. Being a co-host is like your first live show is a dream yeah. because you don't have to get into an advert. You don't have to get back out of an advert. You don't have to sign off. 
So the very first time I did a live TV show where I was the main host was genuinely one of the worst moments looking back ever. Mm. So it was on ITV2. So this was a big deal for me. It's when ITV2 sort of first launched and yeah, it was huge. It was, it was a big, big thing. Mm. And I was asked to present a show for Guinness World Records. The main show was going out on ITV1 and that was presented by Jamie Theakston, who then again was massive. And then I would do the spin-off show on ITV2 called A Few Records More. Mm -hmm. So they do all the main records, Guinness World Records on ITV, then they come to me on ITV2. And it was a half hour show. And on that half hour show, we had lots of different guests breaking world records. So there was a massive element of unpredictability to it. Like, mm. we didn't know how half of them were going to go. Were they going to smash the record or were they not? Mm. How long would they roughly take? We knew how long we had for each segment, roughly. Yeah. And then at the end of the show, so you've got the gallery in your ear. You're wearing an earpiece. So not only are you reading the teleprompter and all that kind of stuff, you've got, I'd say, at least three people talking to you in your ear. You've got the producer, but you've got the director who's directing the shots and everything like that. And then you've got the person who counts you down and they time the entire show mm -hmm. and they back time you and they'll tell you how long you've got to go into the adverts, how long you've got till the end of the show. And I'd been given my final, you know, so you try to differentiate all the different voices, who's talking to who at what time, and you've got to take it all in. And then I knew they were saying that we had 30 seconds to off air. And I'm like, great, because I know roughly how long it's going to take me to do my outro mm -hmm. to the show. I go along and I thank all our guests. Thank you very much for the guy who had the most snails on his face. Well done to the man who unhooked the most amount of bras in 60 seconds. These were actual things. <laughs> thank you to all these, that we got the most amount of people in a mini um, and all these different things. I had thanked them all and said goodbye. And I said to the camera, thanks for watching. See you next time or whatever. And then I hear panic in my ear between the director and the guy and the, the lady who was counting me out no no shit shit we've got it wrong we've got it wrong we've got it wrong 60 seconds left i have counted us out of the show i have said everything that is on the auto queue mm -hmm. there is nothing more to say and suddenly i have to make stuff up for 60 seconds 60 seconds monologue 60 if you seconds. if you have ever tried to like <laughs> learn a monologue or or <laughs> or perform a monologue it's a lot just talking yeah absolute bs for yeah. 60 seconds and i still think of that to this day what do you do so i then had to individually go up and go so anyway to the man who had unhooked all these bras how did you enjoy it? Was it fun? I just thought, I, I, to be honest, I don't know what I said and I don't ever want to watch it back because yeah. it was genuinely the worst moment of my TV life. And we, we, we wrapped up and I, I was just like, oh my God, we, like I somehow managed it. I remember afterwards, again, this is a long time ago, the exec producer at the end of it had an issue with me, I think, to start off with. Didn't pretty much told me before mm -hmm. I got the job that he didn't want me to do the job. He'd yeah. only he'd only hired me because he was told to by the channel. And he made that really clear to me from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So after getting them out of a massive shit show, he didn't even come up and say, well done, congratulations, you saved the show there. And and again I was very young and felt crushed by the whole thing. Was like, oh my God, not even a Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Thank you for getting us out of it. Yeah. It was quite soul destroying. Um, Cause it was, TV is certainly, well it is now, it, it, all industries like that are cliquey. Um, and I think he wanted to hire like a big name and the channel off the back of another show that I'd done wanted me to present it. And so I think that was his way of being like, didn't want you anyway. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was awful, but I, I, I survived it. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. <laughs> there yeah. are worse things to go through. <laughs> but yeah. And uh, like, were there any other like extreme situations when you had to, you know, be quick on your feet? 
But I guess the whole thing with any live TV show is you just, it's constantly being quick mm. on your feet. We did um, another live show that I did after I'd had my first child, Nicole. She was six months old. <clears throat> I had to move to Manchester with her because I was offered this show called Bingo Night Live. And it was late night ITV. Mm -hmm but it paid really well. Yeah. And it was like, right, okay, we have to make this decision when I'm gonna to have to move up to Manchester and take Nicole with me, get a babysitter, and we're gonna to have to figure this out, how we're gonna work it, because her dad at that point was working down here on Radio One. Um, and I was absolutely exhausted. It was, the, it was the most tiring point in my life where I would go to work, I'd leave the flat, at about nine o'clock in the evening. The babysitter would arrive at like eight o'clock. Nine, I'd leave. We'd do all the pre-stuff, pre, you know, meetings and this, that, and the other. We'd sometimes go on air at midnight, mm -hmm. sometimes 12.30, and we'd be live for an hour. So mm -hmm. I'd finish, we'd come off air at say 1.30, sometimes quarter to two. And is it like some kind of, so you are like on the call with, with, the, with the viewers from time to it time? Was, or? It was quite a glamorous setup. There was, there was a lot of cheapy, cheap versions of the show, but ours was quite a big mm -hmm. stage one. It was huge. We would play this bingo and people could play along at home. And then, yeah, there would be a few people calling in, but just for chats, not mm -hmm. for playing games live. Yeah. People would do that like at home remotely. We'd get off air at like 1.30, 1.45, something like that. And you'd be buzzing because you've just done an hour of live TV. And then it takes a long time for that adrenaline to calm down. So mm -hmm. I would come home, I would have a shower, I'd get myself sorted. I wouldn't get to sleep till about half past three. And then my baby <laughs> would wake up at 6.30. So I'd have like three hours sleep. And then the next day I had to play with her, do all the things that you have to do being a mum, mm -hmm. go out, do my shopping, go and do all these different things. And then seven o'clock would arrive or eight o'clock would arrive and then the babysitter would come and yeah. I'd go out and do it all again. I was surviving on three hours sleep. I lost so much weight. I was so exhausted. Yeah. But it's one of those things, isn't it? Well, before we get, we, we dive in more into like how, how hard it is to combine uh, being a parent and especially a mother with a career. Uh, quick question. So you said like when you, when you were on live show, you had this, uh, earpiece yeah. and you hear the voices all the time is it like do you hear everything that happens in the back rooms or like or is it only something that is for you yeah just to be clear they're not the voices in my head I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would, or so you say they would try and make it as minimal as possible but when they're talking through the microphone you can pick up everybody in the gallery okay oh. it's really that was really quite tricky. But you mm -hmm. eventually get used to the voices you're meant to hear. Yeah. It's always tricky if there's three of them talking to you and if they're all the same sex, then it's hard to differentiate. It's easier for you. And the sound is not as perfect as like on, you know, some... It's awful. Yeah. It's really awful. And you, you can't say to them... Well, you can now. I guess people are a bit more relaxed on TV nowadays. But back then you couldn't go, sorry, what did you say? Yeah. <laughs> Who's, who was... was no, yeah, no, okay, no, it was you. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's people are a lot more realistic now with it. I think you can actually go. Sorry, someone's talking mm -hmm. to me in my ear. What's that about? Um, yeah, that was that was quite. It's quite a skill to get used to. I'm because I'm just curious. Like, let's say you're talking to someone, you're interviewing someone, or you're reading from teleprompter, and then suddenly there's a voice, and you have to pay attention to both sources of information. It's impossible all the time. And if you're interviewing somebody, and then some suddenly somebody might remember a question they want you to ask. Oh. While they're listening to the answer and they're like, ask them about blah, blah, do this, do that, do that. So you've got to be able to tune people out, listen to somebody, uh, listen to what, oh, it's, yeah. I don't know. At some point I would say like, can you just kick, well, one yeah. second, can you fuck off? <laughs> okay, yeah, you were saying. <laughs> this is why Paul O'Grady, lovely, lovely Paul O'Grady, who I was really lucky enough to meet a couple of times because he was like a he what, hero to everyone. Um, he famously used to just get on onto set and just remove his earpiece mm -hmm. 
and he'd say, I don't want to, I don't want to listen to that lot in the gallery because he just, he's like, I don't want anyone telling me what to do. I'm just going to do my own thing. Yeah, so he used to whip his earpiece out and never yeah. wear it. And I'm like, that's great. So he had people on the floor, like telling him times and winding up and all mm. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Which we had as well. We, we also had people, you know, you'd have your floor manager who would be like wrapping you up and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. But God, it makes me quite nervous thinking about it again, actually. Oh, really? It's so funny. It brings it all back in a <laughs> yeah. good way. It, yeah. yeah it's, it was, it was interesting. Really interesting. Would you would you want to do it now again? Yeah, it wouldn't I? I don't have the desire like I used to mm-hmm. to do that. Like I really wanted to do that. And like I say, times have changed, and I think that ship sailed. But if the opportunity arose and someone asked me to do it, I mm-hmm. would, and I and and I'd approach it differently because, like I say, I was a lot younger, and really quite. I didn't want to upset anyone. I didn't want to mess up. Like. This version of Jane is very different mm-hmm. to young version of Jane, mm-hmm. where you kind of go, oh, I'm actually not that bothered about so much yeah. anymore. Like, I've got much thicker skin. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say no. Were there any other, like, some interesting, fun stories behind the camera or in front of the camera? Oh, yes. There was a guy, like a proper legend TV presenter called Barry Norman mm-hmm. and he used to present it's like the movie reviews and he was like this lovely older man very kind of dapper and lovely and calm and chilled and everything and he was a guest on our show when we did mm-hmm. live with Christian O'Connell and I I was told in my ear I had for some reason on the show I had this massive bag of fake phlegm I don't know why, What's but it's phlegm? phlegm, as in like what you, <coughs> like the mucus, <laughs> like vomit? mucus from your lungs. Just grow, and I don't know why, but for some reason we had a clear bag, clear plastic bag full of phlegm. And it had been from some prank we'd done on Christian. Okay. I can't remember. So I have it here. Christian sat a bit f- further away than you are next to lovely old man, gorgeous Barry Norman. And I get the producer in my ear going, throw the bag at Christian. And I'm like, what? throw it, throw it at Christian. It'll be hilarious. So I throw it and I miss and I hit Barry Norman in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly died. And Christian just burst out laughing, but also was like, I'm so sorry. And I'm just like, I can't believe I've hit Barry Norman in the balls with a bag of phlegm. So that, that wasn't... One of my finest moments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> okay, so... Sorry, uh, Barry Norman. <laughs> you're a mother of two. Yes, I am. How... How? How? You, how, you, how, how? No, well. I mean, like, I know how. Uh, <laughs> I have my guess. <laughs> This is going to get quite awkward. <laughs> But how did you combine, you know, your career and motherhood? Is it, is it well, possible? Back then when I was doing the, the late night bingo show, that was really hard. And I would never want to revisit something like that again. Certainly with like a very, very, very new baby. Um Now I have a lot more help around me as well, which is definitely useful. But now I do a lot of voiceovers. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, it is genuinely the best career to have with children Mm -hmm. because it's so flexible. They will, my agent will phone me up and say, hey, can you do a voiceover tomorrow or Wednesday or whatever? at 11 o'clock and I'll be like ooh that clashes with something oh we'll make it four. Oh, we'll make it they are so like if if it can be moved they'll move it they are so flexible with it and even like during summer holidays which we've just had I take Piper in with me mm-hmm. like come with me she loves it wherever you do a voiceover record like sound studios are always fun and for some reason they always have loads of sweets loads of treats loads of everything and it's like It's like a kiddie sweet shop and there's always a dog. She loves dogs. So everyone, <laughs> everyone seems to bring their dogs in mm-hmm. and it's just great. Like it's a perfect, perfect job for someone who, I mean, and it's good money. If mm-hmm. you want to perform and you have children, it's like 
Yeah. Great. I know it's easy to say that. It's it's I've had an agent in that industry for over 20 years now. And <clears throat> I was really really lucky to get in with with an agency early on. Um, and back then it wasn't even something I'd considered doing, but because I was presenting, yeah. the agency that I was working with just went, do you want to do voiceovers as well? And I was mm. like, yeah, okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then just started doing stuff. Yeah. And now I've got an amazing agent, Yakety Yak, who are unbelievable. They are such a good agency. Um, and they just, yeah, they they work their backsides off and they, they get a lot of good work in. And it's yeah. just a fun job to do. Mm-hmm. Really fun job. Nice. And yeah. um, I'm, tr- I, I'm trying to get into this as well, but no luck yet. <laughs> it's, I think this is the thing though, Andre. I think at the moment, this is why I say, and I appreciate that I'm lucky. I got in with an agent and have been doing this job for such a long time. Um, now I think the market is, that's definitely changed. I think suddenly everybody's got, oh, I want to do voiceovers. That sounds really, I, I, get it. I get a lot of people on Instagram, people I've never met before, going, that looks fun. I, I might do it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, good. Dude. Good luck. <laughs> it's not as easy as you think. No. Certainly getting into it, as we all know, it's not that easy. Yeah. But yeah, I, um, and it's the one thing I do get on, I would say on a weekly basis, I get people saying, how do I do yeah. that? How can I get I into it? I was one of the people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got no, I've got no problems with my friends. Certainly, my friends who are in the industry mm. asking me about it because it's like, well, that that's an obvious kind of choice for you to yeah. do. But I guess it's sometimes a little bit like when people go, yeah, yeah, I might, I want to give that a go. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying they can't. But yeah. Sometimes you kind of go, okay, it does take a lot of work, a lot of work to to do it. It yeah. really does. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's it's tough it is a tough industry there's a learning curve yes it's a, like it's a profession it's a skill yeah <laughs> so yeah you have to learn uh, yeah. how, how long have you been doing the the voiceovers as well yeah so about <laughs> about 22 years now uh, well yeah <laughs> yeah about 22 years but it's taken off like like crazy in the last year and a bit since i signed up with yakety yak who have just been yeah. incredible. Um, I've had like four or five big TV advertising campaigns. Mm. Another fun thing I did a while back, I got to do some animation yeah. voiceovers, which was so much fun. Because, you know, normally you're reading a script or you're selling something. This was brilliant because the guys I was working for, they gave me like free reign to just go... This is a bear. However you think this bear should talk, give us a few examples. There was a fairy, and then there was an alien, and a caterpillar, and a butterfly, and they were all fun characters. And then there was a a grandma. Mm -hmm. Genuinely had the most fun doing that. It was was brilliant. Like, here, just give it a go. Read Mm -hmm. this script a few times. Give us a few different takes. Like, oh, I love it. Really, really good. But, like, do do you... Do you do voices when you do voiceovers, or are you just like it's, or are you trying to kind of dip into what your voice is? Now, like if I'm hired to do a campaign, like a TV advert, they are coming to me because they want me. They yeah. want my voice. They want. They've probably looked up. They want sort of northern or whatever. Or they usually say with me, it's like warm and friendly. That's kind of my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, smiley or whatever that they go to different people for different things i feel also why i'm quite fortunate at the moment is the northern twang although i my when i go back up home back back up to yorkshire people are just like where's your accent gone (laughs) they don't and and it has it has because i've lived i've lived away from yorkshire longer than i've lived in yorkshire um so my accent's all over the place um, and I'm a bit of a chameleon with people. I sort of adapt to other people's accents as well. Well, or I think, to a degree. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's definitely not as northern as it was, but right now a lot of people do want regional accents. So a lot of it's changed from back in the day where people wanted a BBC RP voice or whatever. Now they don't want that. They want real and they want mm-hmm. authentic. Yeah. So that's that's all good. That's really but good. But I think in character, like in animation or... Well, maybe not games, but like animation, there is more kind of 
<laughs> voice making. <laughs> Animation is yeah. all about yeah. voices. Yeah. Um, and there's a guy I know who he... Um, he does loads of animation. He does like Hey Dougie and stuff like that. And I think he's just made a killing doing all these cartoons for years because mm. he's just a brilliant voice. Again, like a real chameleon. Yeah, it's something I'd probably like to do more of. The gaming side of it, the computer game stuff, I've never quite got to grips with it. I don't get it because I don't watch games. I'm not a gamer. I don't understand games. So I don't understand when people go, we need a voice for this game. I'm like, what do you mean you need a voice well, for I, a game? I can explain to you. Honestly, it's... It's even more acting to a degree. Basically, because maybe kind of maybe you're thinking of games as a bit like well, Candy Crush or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but the games, it's not my world. <laughs> games I'm playing like it's a film, but where I also do some action. It's right. like characters talking to each other. Like, there are games that made me cry because of the scene that was directed by someone where there's a dialogue between two people and like I'm just watching or I sometimes I choose what they will say and then like from what I like my character will say there will be different uh, answer from the another character that I'm talking to. So basically it's like imagine just like a series but you actually tell to your character what to say well from, from, from yeah. different options so it's basically full-on movie or cartoon with amazing characters wow. there, there's like this game called cyberpunk 2077 in which ken reeves was right one of the characters okay. and it's like it's a full-on like i don't know how many hours he had had to spend to record all the dialogue because there's a lot and of it is dialogue. actually Ke keanu reeves yes yes it's keanu reeves he did like the motion capture and okay. everything and uh it's it's insane. It's a game that, like, I spent, and it's hard to say it on camera, <laughs> but it started like it came out during lockdown in 2020 in a very bad state. When it just mm -hmm. came out, it was in a very bad state, very buggy, but I still played it because I love the world yeah. that you play in, the, like this night city and the characters. And I spent all together because I finished the game a few times. I spent almost 900 hours playing this game. There aren't 900 hours in the whole world, Andre. That's a lot of hours. <laughs> and that's Whoa. the thing. And that's how amazing games can be, like, because of the story. There are some some games, it's just like it's a shooter. There are, like, some... some uh, you can... Rec like, there are still voiceover actors who... Uh, say like well this is the base we can we have to attack or like prepare for a battle whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. but there are games that are like huge stories amazing stories better than some some series or films yeah, nowadays yeah, yeah. with a lot of characters and there's like just amazing dialogue so i would say interesting it's yeah it's, it's great and there are like there's some very uh, popular voice or actors there are like the guy i don't remember his name but the guy who voiced the witcher like yeah, because yeah. there's like there's the series Witcher with yeah. uh, Henry Cavill, but there are, there are games about the Witcher, okay. which why actually Henry Cavill heard about the the Witcher books yeah. because he started with the games and then he wanted to do the series. Basically, yeah. So I think like it's it's a big opportunity, but I'm not sure about they they, they do pay decently. I'm not sure like if they could compare like if you could compare pay from like voicing a game in comparison to some good buyout for commercial yeah so like for me it's a very decent yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i wrote really like honestly voicing games for me would be amazing please <laughs> agencies <laughs> uh, because i would really love to get into this stuff uh, and i'm a gamer as well you know yeah. like, not as hard so i think it's i think that's the main thing with me it's not my world mm -hmm. it's not to say i won't entertain mm -hmm. it but i'm just like i don't get games i can I like you know what after the, today or tomorrow I will send you f just a few clips do, on, you like do, to, on YouTube yes. just to show you how it looks, Please how it do. sounds. Please yeah. do. Why did you stop working on TV? Um, it was a mixture of I like after I had Nicole and that job nearly killed me mm -hmm. of taking a bit of a backseat and going. I can't do this and be a mom to a young kid at the same time. And then it became a case of, after I'd been out of the industry for a few years, it was really hard to get back in. Like, like I say, everything had changed around the time of Big Brother to start off with. And then it just felt like, this isn't my world anymore. Like, 
I, I wasn't relevant anymore. I didn't, I, you know, any of the stuff that I that I could have done beforehand, they were now getting people from Big Brother to present yeah. or, you know, anyone who was a name from reality TV. Mm. So it was a case of did she jump or was she pushed? <laughs> and it was kind of a mixture of both. Mm. It was a timing of, you know, having a, having a baby and then being a mom and then going, oh, that job that I did before doesn't really exist. Mm. So, yeah. And then, but then, like I said, that sort of then got replaced with Vine. And then the work came in from that, which was weird. Um, I got to, with that as well, I, I, I got to meet a really, now a really, really good friend of mine called David Schneider, who he was, I don't know if you watch Alan Partridge, he played a big character in that called Tony Hayes. And, um, been in Mission Impossible and all sorts. He's a big director and all sorts of stuff. An actor is awesome. So I got to do lots of stuff and finally got to be directed by him in some of these slightly longer form um, campaigns, online comp- campaigns that we did. Um, so that was nice. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it opened other little doors for me, which was mm-hmm. which was really lovely. But yeah, that was just a. Do you know, it's, it feels like that was a different life there, a mm. different a different lifetime ago as well. And and like very different industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like very it, different. Because I'm guessing it didn't just, it not only changed in the way of like that everything is like digital now, there's like different sides of the media and there are more sources of the media, but it's also like it, it became way bigger, less personal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I just, I don't know. It just, it all feels very kind of, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> so that's not, that's not the best answer to that. No, no, answer, so it's but... fine. <laughs> You're a different, different phase of your life now. Yeah. 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 And then locked over lockdown. That's when I suddenly started to go. I've always wanted to act. Mm-hmm. Never thought about it before. I'd never said it out loud. Actually, what I had said in the past was I'm not interested in acting. When people had asked me, would you want to act or anything like that? And I'd be like, no, I'm not an actor. I'm not a trained actor. I haven't done any of that stuff. And then over lockdown, I started thinking, I, I really like getting itchy about it. Thinking, I, I'd love to go to some classes. I'd love yeah. to train, and do that kind of stuff. It seems like so much fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I started making some phone calls and found working at a studio which is where we met. Yeah. Um, Which was, what was it, like what, three, four years ago? About three. Yeah. About three years ago? Yeah. Yeah, three years ago. Um, and that was my very first ever experience of acting. Yeah. And I will never forget. Were you in that very first class I did? I can't remember. I'm sure you were. Yes, you were. Oh, yes, yes, you were. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, you and Matt, a couple of others. And I've never been so intimidated, scared, nervous, excited in my life okay. before. I remember um, finding out where the class was. I timed it so that I was really early. Obviously didn't want to walk in too early. And I found the door and I swear to God, I nearly walked straight past it because I was like, I can't do this. Mm. I can't, I can feel my heart beating now at that same moment of like feeling that, that intensity of how it oh, felt yeah. at the time. I nearly didn't go in. And then I went into the room, didn't know a single person and was like, and, and was older than everyone by a good 10, 15 years. Hey, 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 very hey, much. No. How, how old are you? I mean, I'm 41. Okay. Well, you just look younger. Damn it. Um, yeah. <laughs> no. All right. Apart from you then. But there was, everyone else is a lot, lot younger than us. Yeah. And I know. <laughs> you're walking in there and there's all like these 20 year olds and they're all fresh faced and awesome. And I'm sat there like, oh my God, what am I doing here? These people have been training for a long time and they know what they're doing and everyone knows what they're doing and I don't. And, oh, what's wrong? Sorry if you hear my cat crying. Um, And then being called up to perform in front of the whole class. Ah, I thought I was going to vomit. I genuinely thought I was going to vomit. Yeah, it it was so Mm nerve-wracking, but the best decision I ever made. Mm -hmm. So this is the other funny thing, Andre. Because when I first started working in TV, that was all really quite relatively easy. Like I I got an agent and then I started working and that was it. I was on telly quite a bit. And I kind of thought I was going to be the same with acting. Like I'll start doing some classes, learn the ropes, get an agent, workloads. 
and you're like that still when when does that kick in when does that actually i don't know happening? it's been nine years for me i'm still waiting <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because i genuinely thought well it must be the same sort of industry it must be the same mm -hmm. um and again, forgetting like I'm older now and all this different stuff. And, and, and the thing I struggle with, I guess, at the moment is I genuinely do not believe there are many parts written for women of my age. Mm -hmm. Unless you are already an established name, if you're a Sheridan Smith or Saran Jones or whatever, because they do seem to use the same. And I love that, you know, they're, being, they're representing our age group. Mm -hmm. But it's very tough to, you're not suddenly just going to get snapped to go, oh yeah, you can play this main role on ITV as well. Yeah. Um, and I do think there just aren't many roles for us because certainly as a woman, I do feel a little bit like we become invisible to writers for some reason when it gets to a certain age. Mm -hmm. like, I do, like I'm 47 now and I feel like so they're like, well, you go on Mandy and things like that. And <laughs> they'll be casting a mother and a teenager. So for the teenager, they want like, they, for, for all the legal reasons, they'll go with an 18 year old who can look 16. Yeah. But for then the mother of that, they'll say maximum age 30. And you're like, okay, I mean, it's pushing it a bit. Sometimes it's 25 and you're like, we do. I have an eight-year-old in real life. I have mm -hmm. a 17-year-old in real life. Women in their 40s still live a life. We still have sex, weirdly enough. Do you know what I mean? It's like we exist. We have fun. We know our own minds. Yet writers who are writing this stuff don't seem to think that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It seems like, well, if you're going to have fun and you're going to do this and you're going to do that, you've got to be in your 20s. It's like, absolutely not. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. I wish... I wish there would be more writers who are young, young writers who are able to see outside of their world and go, if you're in your mid to late 40s, you can still be glamorous. You can still be fun. You can still do this, that, and the other. You can be really interesting. In fact, I would say we're more interesting now because we've learned so much. We don't put up with as much bullshit anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, write something. Write something about that. I feel that. like I'm not sure about young writers. Young writers write about what they know. Mo like a lot of writers mostly write about what you know yeah uh, but i think there are like there's a lot of older experienced writers who could write for you know people their age <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but can they it, just start please do you think do you think it's it's because and i honestly i don't know like do you think <laughs> it's because writers are ignorant or do they tailor what they write for the main public and it's mostly kind of younger people I don't are know. heroes? I don't know, because I've got, I've got a lot of friends who work in TV. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> everyone seems as confused, because it's like, who are people writing for these days? Because even when it comes to your reality TV, me and my friends of my age, mm -hmm. we always say, like, for example, your Love Island. It's like, we're kind of over watching gorgeous glamorous, young, 20-something-year-olds strutting around in bikinis or their, their shorts getting off with each other. It's boring now. It's like we've seen it. We've seen it a million times. We want to see a dating show where it's your older end who've been divorced a couple of times. Some of them are a bit bitter. Some of them are absolutely ecstatic that they're finally rid of this person who's been mm. tying them down. Put them in a room together. Get them sunbathing around the pool. I guarantee your conversations will be a hell of a lot meatier. There will be so much more talked about. Like, just life. Mm -hmm. just, and, and, and like I say, there will be no shits given. They will talk about anything. They won't be thinking about, this is the problem. A lot of the young kids that go onto Love Island and stuff, I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. They go in there already thinking about their brand. Yes. They're going in as a business. Our age wouldn't do that. They'd be like, well, it's a free holiday. Brilliant. We'll, um, we might meet some, we might not. Who cares? Yeah. There'll be a laugh. Um, I, d I don't know. I just think you'd end up with some, you'd, you'd end up with gold. And I know I would be watching it. And I know my eldest daughter would watch it as well because she'd think it'd be hilarious. So maybe you should produce it. 
Let's, why don't we do this together? I don't have any, you know, <laughs> contacts or money. Oh yeah, there's 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 a small issue of money, right? Okay, we learn. I, I genuinely do think that that needs to mm. be made. I mm. do. I think what a glorious show that would be. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think I think they did something like that with Bachelors, right? Uh, there the, are all, all those shows about like a guy picking up one girl out of 30 girls or yeah. a woman like does the same. I think they did a version of that like with, you know, older people. Well, that's good. Yeah. How old are we talking? I'm not sure, but I've heard like something around like 50s, 60s. I okay. Think. Yeah, so maybe even like, maybe even older, but I'm, I, I don't think, no. I think yeah. maybe 60s. But like when you watch things like Traitors and things like that, which is just a brilliant TV, it's always the older ones that are fun, that are interesting, that make it worthwhile watching. I have some life experience and personality. Yeah. <laughs> but it's about when people go in there and they, again, with, when, and it's not their fault for being young and gorgeous, but like... Fuckers. They're, they're very self-conscious at that age. We all were. We, you know, it, it, yeah. you're at the peak of being self-conscious at that point. And yeah, you know, it depends on, on from person to person, but yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but but I do think that you you're, you're less careless. prepared. You're you, less prepared yeah. for for the for the anxiousness. Yeah, I'm still anxious right now about many things about myself, but I kind of came to terms in accepting the anxiousness. Not myself. Yeah. I don't accept myself, but yeah. anxiousness. I can kind of deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. I'm so. sort of like that, I suppose. <laughs> I guess. I guess we're all like that, aren't we? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and so you're acting. You started working at the studio. It was very scary. Do you remember what was the scene that you did the first? Yes, time? I did, and it was a scene from This Is England. With who? Oh, I was with Miranda. Oh, okay. And I was I was so fortunate that I got put with Miranda, mm. and I think Lee actually put me with Miranda because I think he saw that I was really quite nervous mm. and knew that Miranda. W- obviously is just the loveliest person. Um, and she was so kind to me yeah. and so generous and just like, I was like, I was there going, what do we do? You know when he goes, <laughs> right, right, you've got five minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, what, five minutes to do what? What do we do in these five minutes? To become brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so for anybody who is watching and doesn't know of the whole situation there, so you go into class, you're given a scene and then, yeah, you're given five minutes to prepare. The scene was given to you way before yeah. you learned it at home you prepared it at home yeah. prepare it with then, your with your yeah. partner yeah. and then perform it and she was so lovely but i remember the scene was about like fingering <laughs> and it was of course <laughs> and it was like the whole thing was like oh my god this is this okay mm. so we're going straight in there <laughs> and and i loved it mm. i absolutely yeah. loved it. It's I like a drug, isn't it? So much fun. Yeah. yeah. And then from that I got um I got my first job which was a, for a short film and loved it. I oh, that was it. Yeah. So I went for my very first audition. Mm. And it was an in-room in-person audition. And I got the job. So you can imagine I was like well, this is easy. <laughs> like, this is how it works. First audition, got the job. Yeah. Yes. And then it's quite quiet after that. But it did that and it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Loved every second of it. And then I've just wrapped on um, my very first feature film, which is good. It's called Spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, with this amazing director called Janelle Rowe, who... Again, just the loveliest guy and the sweetest crew. You know, you just think, God, I got really, I got really lucky with the cast, with the, everybody. The cast were just adorable. And especially for me being brand, brand new, mm-hmm. everyone just helps each other out. And I was so grateful for that. They yeah. were, yeah, a really, really nice team. Um, but yeah, the, the whole self-tape thing for me is bizarre. I find yeah. it really strange. I, I, I much prefer... In the room. Going to meet somebody yeah. because you can chat with them and you can what you lack in skill as a di- as a as an mm-hmm. actor, you might be able to charm them with, you know, your personality. It's like any like any interview, basically. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And if they can see that they want to work with you, then yeah. that's great. You can't get any of that across on a on a self tape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I think I've heard a lot from more experienced, you know, actors. Yeah. And directors and people just you know, in a career, they say like they don't just cast your 
acting skills, they cast your personality mm. and you because they know they will have to spend a lot of time with you on set yeah. and they want to enjoy this time yeah. rather than, you know, having terrible time all the time with someone who's a dick yeah. to everyone. Exactly, exactly. I read something recently with Olivia Coleman, and she was talking about her experience as an actor starting out. And she said there is not a chance in a million years that she would have got where she got today mm -hmm. if she had had to do self-tapes. Yeah. She said it was always about winning the person over. And she said it was really interesting because she said, you know, that you knew sometimes you were going into an, a, an audition and you knew that they didn't want you from the get-go. And she said, I loved that challenge of winning them over in the room. To be fair, to be fair, Olivia so, Coleman also is fucking brilliant. Oh, she's awesome. She is <laughs> awesome. But knowing that she had moments of, I know you don't want me, yeah. but I'm going to make you like me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know. Yeah. You I, can't I, do that on a self-tape. I haven't been in a room, a room edition for probably five years. Mm. It's all self-tapes now. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of hard. Well, it's really hard. Do, do you think um, your experience as a TV presenter, working on TV, like helps you in any way in acting? No, I really don't. Because, yes, it's in front of a camera. So one thing for sure, you should be comfortable, you know, in front of a camera. Or mm -hmm. is it very different? Thing. It's a completely different beast. Yeah. Like, I, you act in a different way. Mm -hmm. You are doing a completely different job. Different things are running through your head. When I am presenting, like I said, I'm, re I'm reading. Firstly, I'm usually reading. Mm -hmm. And it's just about you, your personality, you, actually you. You're not thinking about emotion. You're not thinking about range. You're not thinking about anything. You're thinking about, I'm just going to tell you this interesting fact about this. No, but, you, but you still <laughs> do think about emotion a little bit because you want to present it in like sometimes in a fun way or yes. exciting way. Or I don't know, it depends maybe on what you're presenting in like in a sad way, like someone passed away or whatever. Like there is still kind of a range of emotion you want people to feel. Or is it? I think it's, I, I feel it's very different. Is Very it, is different. It way more. Is it fake? Which bit? Uh, the, the, the TV presenting. It's all fake, isn't yeah. it? Acting's fake. It's all fake. Yeah, well, we try to dip into kind of real emotion, but again, to a degree. We're still, yeah, we're, we're still we're, playing. We're still acting. I guess that's the thing. I guess whether you're TV presenting, whether you're doing a voiceover, whether you're doing acting, it's all playing, isn't it? At yes. the end of the day, it's all playing at being someone. So I guess tenuously, yes, they're similar in that way. But the method and the approach, like I was not in any way, shape or form prepared mm -hmm. for how we've been taught. Like it was brilliant and eye opening to me. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, this is a whole new world that I didn't understand and didn't know about and just didn't know how to approach. No one ever taught me how to present. It's like you stand in front of a camera and do your thing. And it's, that's it. Yeah. It's so, it's so, I think it's so detached. Other people might disagree. Um, I personally find it very different. Mm. Mm. You enjoying it? The acting side of it. I love, like in class and everything like that, I love it. I yeah. absolutely love it. And I remember when I did, um, the very first short that I did. And I remember saying to Lee afterwards, like, oh my God, it was amazing. And the weird thing was, even though this was an actual job that I was getting paid for, I didn't feel nervous. And, yes. and, and he said something to me and it stuck with me and it's so true. He said, that's because you know that they wanted you, they picked you mm. because they liked what you did. When you're in class, you're questioning yourself. You're like, shit, am I any good? I don't know whether I did that right. Oh God, I need validation. Someone tell me I'm great. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so weird. So you're, the nerves were taken away. I was like, yeah. you know what I can do. And that's why you've hired me. Mm -hmm. And that's so true. Yeah, I know. And to be fair, like this, this is not the first time when, when uh, I speak to my guests about this on a podcast.
because I think most of us experience that like for some reason in class even though I know like I love those people in class I know no one wants me to fuck up no one no. kind of sees their way like yeah show yeah. us what he no everyone like it's very supportive uh, surrounding but at the same time you are I stopped being nervous too nervous like last year but before that all all the years like four years that I spent with Lee I still I get nervous every time I wanted to I like I got up to perform in front of people yeah and uh, the only acting job that I had this year uh, for this uh, series the inside man I caught myself on on the on set once and I actually I messaged Lee about it. I told him like thank you for everything that you did for us because I was on set and I was completely relaxed I knew what I was doing yeah I knew everything I hit the marks I hit the continuity I know what I'm doing I can listen to for, for you know direction and change everything and I can like and I'm absolutely free and I was I knew like you know what I did a lot of I I I am prepared. I am a fucking actor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, Andre. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work as often, but that's that's the thing in class. You you're way more nervous because you kind of you are putting out your work in class to a degree for judgment. Yeah. Not like, you know, people will judge you, but like it is for judgment. On set, you're doing your work, you're doing your job. Yeah. In class, you kind of In class you're there to improve. Yeah. So you're going in here and you want to be here. So I guess that's how it's meant to work, really, mm -hmm. isn't it? We're meant to. So, so automatically we go, oh, I'm going in at this and I know it needs tweaking. But for it to be tweaked, I've got to have somebody tell me my faults yeah. and how, how I'm doing it. So no, as humans, we're, we're not programmed to want to hear that. But we are putting ourselves up for it. Yeah. And, we're, <laughs> and we're, pay it. we're paying for it. We're, we're paying for someone to yeah. say, that was bad, do it this way. <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't think you would pay to someone to come to class every time and hear like, oh my God, it was so no. brilliant. It was amazing. There is no flaws. Exactly. Like, what? Fuck that. Well, you don't, you don't learn anything that <laughs> yeah. way, do you? That's yeah. it. The hard truth is you've got to, you've got to go through that mm. to learn and to get better. Mm. If someone's constantly telling yeah. you you're brilliant, then what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, It's probably not true. <laughs> I have been to a couple of classes like that elsewhere. Yeah. And they have felt a little bit like that where everything everyone does is great. And mm -hmm. you're like, was it though? <laughs> mm. I'm not sure it was. Because, <laughs> you know, if you're telling that person this and me this, I don't, I'm mm. not sure. I'm not, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a funny one. I think it's, it's, you've got to be brutal mm. if you want to learn. But you've got to be able to take that. Yeah. No, it's, it's for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. like you, you need, like we are afraid of criticism, but we need criticism at yeah. the same time. But there's sure. like, but there's a huge difference though. Like because there, there is some places, some critics can just try to put you down. Yeah. And there are like some people who actually try to help you, and it's hard sometimes to kind of figure out who's who. Yeah. Because there are so many frauds in in the industry as well. Of course. So many people who are just like pretending that they're something they're not. <gasps> oh my God! You just reminded me of when I first finished university, so I was 21, and there was an advert in the stage, news, again, physical newspaper, and it was advertising for, I don't know if this was actors or presenters or something, and it was, to, it was a guy claiming to be an agent. That was it, he was claiming to be an agent, and I can picture him now. Oh my God, he was so creepy. Mm. And I was living in Yorkshire and I traveled all the way down on coach, on a coach to come to London for the day mm. to see this guy. And that was a big thing, you know, as a young girl to go to London for the day to meet an agent. It was really scary. I didn't know London and it was terrifying. Mm. And went to this place and there was a couple of us sat outside, all girls, all looking the same, very similar. Um, We all had blonde hair. We were all fairly tall. And it was all like, it's interesting. We like all look very similar to each other. And then he called us in one at a time and asked us if he sat there looking really kind of like, oh, I remember he had this crust in between his hands in his fingers here. And he had 
saliva here, constant like spit, foamy spit on the corners of his mouth. He's really quite old, short, white hair. And he creeps me out really a lot to start mm. off with. And I should have walked away at that point. And um, he made me read a couple of things out, I think, to make it look legit. Then he asked me to remove my jacket and take my top off. And I was so scared. And But we were in... We were in like this official, I forgot, it's a building in Covent Garden. And um, young me didn't realize anyone can hire these rooms out. You're yeah. like, in my head, I'm like, wow, look, it's a brilliant office. It wasn't. He was in there on his own. He'd, pulled a, he'd put a table in there. Yeah. He asked me to take my top off and I said no. He, firstly, before that, he'd got me to take my blazer off. And I was wearing quite a tight top. And he stood and walked around me and then asked me if I'd feel comfortable removing my top. And I said, no, I wouldn't. And I'm surprised I even said that because I was really scared back then. I wasn't the me I am today. Yeah. And, um, and he said, well, I just need to know uh, that, you know, if we take you on, that you'd be comfortable doing nude scenes in a film if it, if it should ever come up. And I was like, no, I really wouldn't. And he's like, well, you won't really get far in this industry if you won't. And then he wanted to charge me 500 pounds and I went away, even though I was creeped out. And this is my very first experience of an agent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went back up north. I remember my whole family were like, what was it like? How was it? Was it good? And I, and I, I, I missed out the bit about taking my top off. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but he wants 500 pounds. And I remember my, my brother was like, I'll, I'll pay for that because he was working and everything. I, I can pay for that if that's what you need. And we can, you know, because they all thought it would be a great thing. Yeah. And I'm like, I know, I don't think this is right. There was something just in the back of my head going, this is not right. And thank God. Thank God I didn't hand over a penny of cash. But also, it's weird because you hear these stories sometimes, but they almost seem like urban legends. Mm -hmm. But this yeah. actually happened. And you realize how easy it is for someone to go, I'm going to hire that room for a day. And I'm going to get my kind of woman, whether it be blonde or whatever, mm. I'm going to get a load of you to come along, stand there, ask you. Some of them may have taken their tops off. Not for sure. Some of them may yeah. have done because they thought that's how you get ahead and that's what you have to do. And it was a proper casting couch moment of like, and I've never experienced it since or anything mm -hmm. like that. But when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, because I really wanted to get into TV. And I thought that was it. Ah, oh, man. I just think now if anyone did that to my girls, I would remove their eyes mm -hmm. from their sockets. But they, people do this. Do you think... I mean, I'm sure it still happens, but it feels like now there should be less of that. Just just in terms of, like, there is way more publicity to whatever you do. Well, this is it. Now, I think that's probably one benefit of social media, that if someone tried that now... And they do. They would be outed yeah. straight away, and people would film it. People people probably go in there filming anyway, just to make, if they didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. They'd get their cameras out. Didn't mm -hmm. have a camera. Didn't have a phone. Didn't have a, didn't have a mobile phone then. Travelled down to London. And this and is you, a, you I used paper map to get I, used, I had an A to Z. Didn't have a way of even contacting my parents when I felt like, oh, this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. Had nothing. I had yeah. to get on a coach and come back. Yeah, Dodge. I, oh, I'd love to be able to remember his name. Mm -hmm. Vile Cretin. It's probably mm -hmm. dead now. He was really old. Ugh. God, that's literally, I've not thought about that for years. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> You've triggered me. It's good to get it out. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's oh. good to know there are people out there like that and just to avoid them mm. and go with your gut. Yeah. That's what I'm always saying to my girls, go with your gut. I've heard somewhere that uh, intuition is way more developed than women uh, in this kind of, like, because guys usually don't, like, we very rarely have this thing, like, bad vibe like we, uh, we do a little bit but like with not as much yeah and i've heard there like there there were cases in like in in big companies when someone is trying to hire someone and like all men in a room are totally fine with the candidate and all women just have this like ding ding yeah. ding, ding 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 no there's something is wrong and it's like you can't guarantee but like they they all often say that for women i think it's very because 
like they're, they're more way more picky on right. those like and they pick up on those like tiny subtle details that we don't interesting that you say that because my eight-year-old has i've always said she's so in tune with her feelings and her gut reaction mm -hmm. is amazing and that's like if we're walking down the street i can feel her hand will hold differently she'll hold tense or she'll move to the side or whatever and she's always very polite she mm -hmm. never wants to offend anyone but if she she'll move to one side and i'll say is everything okay and she'll be like I just got a bad feeling about that person. Mm -hmm. And it's just it, it based on nothing, but she'll be like, I just I just got a bad feeling about that person. I'll be like, good. She goes, and she'll say, I'm because I've always said, go with your gut. And she'll mm -hmm. go, I'm just going with my gut, mm -hmm. mummy. I'm, and I'm like, no, no, that's good. I'm I, but I'm also yeah. trying to say to her, don't be scared of everyone, don't be scared yeah. of everything. But at the same time, if your gut is telling you, yeah. you must listen to it. So yeah, maybe, maybe that is a thing with girls. I, I think it's not even like it's it's not based on nothing. It's based on something. It's just like she can't explain it to herself. Yeah. Why? Like, but uh, because just in general, women are in more danger <laughs> than Hells men are. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, at least you know from men. Men are also in a lot of danger from other men. <laughs> But I let you know what. Firstly, Andre, I appreciate you actually recognizing that because yeah. that's a that's a thing for women. We know. We know 100% that not all men are bad. We just yes. don't know which ones are the bad ones. Yeah. So we need you. We need our, our, our male allies to go mm. and stand up for us mm. and be like, we know some of you other guys can be absolute, you know, yeah. Cambridge University netball teams. Mm. We, need, we, need, um, we need the good guys to stand up for us. Because we are very aware, because that whole not all men thing, I get it when people get, oh, not all men are like that. We're like, no, we're not. We know, we know we're not stupid. Mm -hmm. And we are very grateful to our amazing husbands, boyfriends, brothers, dads, friends who are just great to us. Mm -hmm. You know, my husband's awesome. I, some of my best friends are lads. Like I've always had m more male friends than female friends. Yeah, so is my cat. <laughs> but I but 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 that doesn't mean we're not scared. So like I'm terrified sometimes when I walk out mm. a, a lot. Like if if I'm on my own, I'm really I can be really scared. Yeah. But I love it when a so I've had it before where I've been walking and a guy's been walking quite close behind me and he actually said, "I'm really sorry if I'm scaring you. I I don't mean to be. I'll, I'll walk to the other side of the road." I'm like, "Oh my god, thank you. Thank you for actually getting it. I love that. I appreciate mm. that so much." Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. tricky. And you've got a daughter. Yes. So, you know, you'll be experiencing all that because she, because every woman, every woman, and, and sadly, I believe at 14 years old, probably your daughter, because I know my daughter did at the age of 11. That's the first time she was aware of men saying things to her that were inappropriate. It happens to every single female, every single woman, every single girl. Yeah. And it's awful. Yeah. It's awful awful she was 11 was my daughter and her friend and they were walking past the park in their school uniform after school and two guys in a white van start shouting inappropriate stuff out the window and it's like they were in their school uniform and yes they may look a little older than they look but that means they probably look 13 they certainly didn't look 21 do you know what i mean like what are you playing at mm. and, and and do you know how that makes us feel it makes us feel so so awful. And then we do this typical thing, which talking to other, other women since and um, friends when that's it. One thing that I, I, I speak to my girls about a lot is you don't have to say things to make a man feel better and feel relaxed. Because when someone says something inappropriate to us, our first, our initial reaction is to go, and laugh at the man who's been really inappropriate and go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we don't want to offend him. And we've got to get that into our heads of actually going, no, 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 it doesn't matter how he feels. But also we can, do you know, I'm waffling here. This is probably all bullshit. <laughs> no, it's true. I, I, know what you, I know what you mean because I was a witness to something like that because I remember I had to once ask like uh, security in a club to get someone out mm. just because I've seen that they were very inappropriate to my colleague. Mm. And she was basically trying to laugh it off because as I understand, like she was going through stuff like that. And as any woman probably goes through stuff like that, like periodically, and it's like you don't want to get in a, in a conflict. You mm -hmm. want just to kind of, 
you know, realize the situation with the, yeah, laughing it off, like yeah. making a joke out of it, even though there wasn't anything funny about it. Yeah. Because then we also get the, like, if we don't laugh at their crap jokes or whatever, we're then accused of being a bitch or accused mm. of whatever. And it's like, no, we're not. We just don't want to hear it. We're just sick of it. Mm. <laughs> we are just sick of it. I'm, I think I'm more passionate about this right now as well, especially because I've got two girls. Yeah. And I know they've got all this to come. Mm. One's already dealing with it, but yeah, an eight-year-old. And I'm like, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare treat my daughter in that way. It's just, yeah, it's a bit rubbish. Yeah. My cat has been really annoying. Yeah, she's, Why don't you come up here then? And cute. Come say hi. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Now we had a podcast cat. <laughs> Yay, podcat. Bum in my face. I remember we were talking to you uh, yesterday about what could you expect from the podcast and blah, blah, blah. But, and you told me that you would like to discuss OCD and how to deal with that. Yeah. Oh, I um. I suffered really badly with OCD when I was young, really young. But I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what OCD was. Mm. Again, because there was no internet, no nothing. And I remember I was probably about eight years old and there was a documentary on Channel 4 and it was about OCD. And I'm watching it and I'm like, oh my God, all this, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. I do this stuff. I thought I was just being really weird and really crazy. And, and I kept it secret from everybody. And again, you realize as you get older, women, especially mask stuff, mm -hmm. were really good at that. And um, yeah, I had all these rituals and things I had to do. Like what? Um, started off, the first things I actually remember being very, very, very young and having um, my alarm clock at the side of the bed. And it was a digital alarm clock. And this is quite common with a lot of people. I don't think this is all necessarily OCD. This is just where it started for me. And all the numbers had to add up to a certain thing. I got very kind of like, just, it was all numbers and it had, it had to add up to the perfect number. And that perfect number that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It had to be a number that felt right to me. Mm -hmm. And then I had to close my eyes. And if I reopened them for any reason, I had to do the whole thing again. Um, and every time it was always based on, if I didn't do it, something bad would happen. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, it was quite, there was, there was a reason for doing it. Then it got, you know, it was all, all to do with counting. Every, every single thing was numerical. And one of the most frustrating things that was so time consuming that I used to do was when I would brush my teeth, you know, when you rinse the toothbrush at the end and so I'm holding my tooth, thanks Kat, <laughs> so I'm holding my toothbrush here and the water would rinse the tooth, uh, toothbrush bristles. Mm -hmm. And then it had to run all the way down. I had to lift my thumb up and the water had to touch the whole toothbrush all the way down to the very end. I had to touch every single part of the toothbrush the perfect number of times. Mm -hmm. And again, that number doesn't exist. So it got to the point where, I, and <laughs> just to give you a brief example. So I had to get past six. So this is all in my head really obvious. I'm like, got to get past six. That's a terrible number. Seven's good. However, seven's too close to six. Eight, mm, eight's okay but I'd like to get further away from six. Nine, I don't like because nine is an upside down six. 10, <laughs> 10 is all right, but one plus zero, just one. I don't like the number one because right now I'm not feeling odd numbers. So I get to 11, one and one is two. Don't really like that because two ones on their own didn't look good. 12, two and one is three, didn't like three. 13, forget 13. Bear in mind, this is the amount of times I'm doing this, like, precisely on my toothbrush, 13, get past 13. 14, I really liked the number 14, but it was next to 13, so I can't do that. 15, five and one is six. Six is a terrible number. 16, 16 is good because six and one is seven, but six has it's got a six in it. 17, 17 was all right, but seven minus one is six. Do you see how this went on? Mm -hmm. And all the time, I'm rinsing my toothbrush this amount of times. The good number most of the time was 44. So the, and if I got it wrong, if I broke the water on my toothbrush, you started over. I had to start again. And it wasn't like, let's just get to 44. I had to do the whole, because a different number might feel better this time. Then, so, so that was just, I, and if I didn't do it, 
I was doing it to protect my family. If I didn't do it this exact amount of times and I didn't do it correctly, someone I loved would die. So I was protecting my family. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, then I'm at an age of like, I just started driving. So I was like 17, 18. And I remember I then started taking laxatives, which was mental. But I had the same thing applied with how many laxatives I took. I had to take the right, and again, so sometimes I'd be taking 44 laxatives because that was the number that felt right. Nothing stayed in, it's a gross thing to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Nothing stayed in me. I was literally, and, and the reason I remember because I was driving, I'd just passed my driving test and suddenly was like, I'd, I'd eaten, <laughs> this is probably TMI, but I'd just eaten a Sunday lunch and had all these laxatives and then was stuck behind a tractor and managed to get to a pub toilet and just was like, I don't think I can leave. This is mm -hmm. the worst thing in the world. It was awful. Mm -hmm. um, then my brother, Chris, I told him about it. I didn't tell anybody else about it at all. Nobody else in my family knew about it because I'm like, oh, all my friends. I hid it completely from everyone. But he caught me doing the toothbrush thing one day. And he's like, what are you doing? And I told him and mm -hmm. I burst out crying. And he helped me out. He's going, I promise you, if you do not do this today, nothing bad will happen. Just take it one day at a time. And I managed to sort of get out of it. And somehow, and, I, and then I got my first proper boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And when the, the, with the laxatives and all that combined, it was really quite humiliating and embarrassing. So I managed to suppress it completely. Then it came back with a vengeance years later. So Nicole... Sorry, Nicole, my eldest, is now 17. When she was six, she had to have surgery and it was quite a big, horrible surgery she had to have. And the lead up to her surgery, it came back because it's a protective thing. And I'd go into her room, she'd be asleep in bed and I had this whole routine I had to do in her room around her, which was, me, hey, stay here now, um, meow, which was go in, I had to kiss her on her cheeks, with every single finger, they had to touch mm -hmm. every part of her face. And then, while well, she's asleep, and then check her window, walk backwards into her little bathroom, check this, check the loft hatch, do this, go back to the window, be in case something had happened since I've left the room, go back, kiss her cheeks again, walk out of the room backwards. And if it didn't feel right, do it all again. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't, something would have gone wrong in surgery. And I was, by this point now, I'm older and I'm in tears with it all. It was exhausting. And there was nothing I could do about it because I'm like, I'm doing this. To, it's a, it is a protection. I'm doing this to save her. And it's, what if I don't do it and something bad happens? Mm -hmm. Then it's on me. And I could completely justify it. So it, I would say it's gone now. I don't do any of that stuff now. But I guess there's always a little bit. It never. I guess it never really leaves you. And it's something that's just... It's exhausting. So there's things that I do now that I'm like, oh, I bet that's mm -hmm. OCD related. Do, do you know how it all started? From what? The no. thought of protection? No. I, I guess really I should probably speak to somebody about that at some point, because <laughs> I would like to know, because yeah. I do find it really fascinating. Yeah. I'd love to know where it comes from, what started it. Something must have triggered it, right? Mm -hmm. For me to go, numbers and me, I will fix this. And I don't know. Not a clue. You never sought like a professional help. You were basically first your brother helped you and your mm. boyfriend. And then after uh, the, the surgery on Nicole, like how did it, did you just stop? Just pushed it down. Mm -hmm. I think it just, it kind of just stopped. But again, I, I do think this is where women mask so much, so much better than men. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just seemed to go. Like I, I, can, I don't know. I don't know. But it, 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 it went as quick as it came. Yeah. Crazy though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And just and very like all consuming. Well, crazy has a very, very negative <laughs> yeah. kind of yeah. shade to, to the world. But, it's, but it's, it's kind of, you know, I, I feel I can say that because it was me yeah. and I, I, no, I, yes, I lived it. Yes, I understand. It. But no, when, when you were describing it, I, I was like, yeah, I was like, well, that's, it's, that's incredible. And like, imagine having that all going through, like those numbers and, and figuring yeah. those numbers out constantly, constantly, constantly. Yeah. 24-7. No, Everything was shaped on numbers and mm. it being the right number. Yeah. Well, hopefully. 
Yeah, but I do. I find it. I do find it fascinating. I think. I think our minds are all a bit bonkers, though, aren't they? Oh, I, <laughs> I wouldn't even try to open this kind of works. <laughs> I mean, I went through 90s in, in the ex-Soviet country. My childhood is very different from... Wow. <laughs> from of course, now I can, I, can, I can only imagine. Look, so what, what's your... Is there anything in the, in the pipeline for you right now? I am thinking about going back to class soon. I want to. I really want to. Um, it's just since we moved down to Hastings and then there's summer holidays oh, yeah. and then there's this and then there's that. And I've got to work it around Ross's work and all that kind of stuff. So getting into London and back... Mm. It's not that hard, but I want to do it, and mm. I, you know, and I will, I will. I've just got to make that effort and do it properly because I love, I love going into class. It's great. It's such a, yeah. it's just a nice environment, it's isn't fantastic. it? Fantastic. If you would have to speak to your younger self right now, what would you say say to yourself? Like any any things that you would tell yourself to differently? Um, I would say, don't ever hold back. Go for it. If you want to do that thing, do it. If someone tells you you're showing off who cares mm. don't let somebody else try and tell you what you should do if you've got a dream and you, and you want to do it do it give mm. it a go like you know we talked earlier on about regrets i don't have regrets but i have a wish that maybe i would have started the acting thing younger mm -hmm. but that said maybe like it wouldn't have been right for me back then oh hello It wouldn't have been right for me back then. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't as thick skinned. I wouldn't have lasted two minutes. Now I'm in a better position, you know, financially stable at least to be able to go, right, okay, now I can give that a go. If I'd have started it, say like in my twenties, I'd have given up. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have lasted. I wouldn't, it, yeah. it would not have worked out for me. But yeah, I think, I think for sure, like give everything a go. Mm -hmm. Rule everything out that you might think you want to do, that you don't want to, you know, do you know what I mean? Let, try everything. That's, that's kind of my advice, I guess. Mm. And for, for someone who would probably want to start doing the same thing that you were doing, for example, uh, TV presenting, is it, is it, would you advise to anyone to start now to try to be like a TV presenter? Or you would say, uh, go on YouTube. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, I, I, but I say this. I say this to myself, and and I'm constantly saying this to friends as well. Make stuff, do stuff. You've got the like. You've got it all at your fingertips these days. If you want to create, go create. There's obviously there's always going to be something that might stop you from doing yeah. it, and whether that's time, money, or whatever, or even like a writer's block, a creative block. But if you want to do something, you can put yourself out there now. It's like, you know, people back in the day wanting to be singers. It was really hard to get your stuff out there unless you were signed. Now you don't need to be signed. You can put yourself out there and it might get shared and people might see it and you might end up doing whatever, even if you're not signed. Or you know, There's a girl that I saw recently and she's just starting her own little campaign with, on Instagram, which is she wants to perform at Coachella next year doesn't have any songs out. Oh, she has, she's, she's released her own songs. She has, mm -hmm. isn't signed to a label. And she's like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna perform at Coachella next year. Put yourself out there, do these things. Yeah. And then you might, you mm -hmm. might not, but you might, you know, if you get enough traction, there's so many people out there these days who are big in their own field. I think it always surprises me when I'll, I'll discover a new Instagram account or, mm -hmm. or an Instagram account. And I feel like I've just discovered them and they've got like 15 million followers. And I'm like, how are you this big? And I've never heard yeah. of you. That will always baffle me. Yeah. Like when we were younger, you were either famous or you weren't. Mm -hmm. People had either heard of you or they hadn't. Yeah. But now it's like, God, there's all these different sectors where people are famous for doing this. People are famous for mm. doing that. And like, there's, you know, there's, it's, it's, It's bonkers, isn't it? Yeah. And the, like, I, I believe there is room for everyone right now. Yeah. You just need to work on, on what are you doing. And That's put it. a lot of effort into it. What, like, what would you say from your own experience, your most valued skill is something that you would say to young people, like, you need to get sorted this now to do... I don't know, to work as a presenter, to be in front of camera, because... Well, I think, I think with anything, I actually do think it's not necessarily about your skill as such, it's putting the hours in. Mm -hmm. 
putting the hours in. Just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Whatever it is, you'll get better at it. You'll hit the right audience. Eventually, mm -hmm. you will. It's just you've got to want to. And yeah. I think that's where I went off the boil a while back. I just didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, I just don't want to anymore. And then if I know, I know now that if I started to put the hours back into put, doing videos again, I know they could take off again Yeah. because I've done it a few times. And it's like, it's, re it's not, let's like say it's easy, but it is relatively straightforward to do. Mm -hmm. You've just got to want to. You've got to have that passion and that drive. And when that time comes around, you'll do it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, just keep putting the hours in. All right. <laughs> so look, we're almost done. Before we go to one cool thing, we have a blitz round. Oh. Quick questions, quick answers. There is no right and wrong answer. Few. Apart from some that I would disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there is no points. No prize. Oh, damn it. And Andre, no I want point a prize. of doing this. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I don't have a prize on me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. Okay. Texting or talking? Texting. Cats or dogs? I've got two cats. Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your one guilty pleasure? Ooh. 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 What's my guilty pleasure? Listening to Chase and Status really loud in the car. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you laugh? My husband and my children a lot. And what makes you angry? My husband and my children a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any nicknames? For me, um, my husband calls me Blarp. <laughs> Interesting. Yep. I've got other ones that I can't really repeat, but yeah. No, that's a shame. <laughs> oh, but at university, um, so my surname's Sharp, and there was a, a character in Coronation Street called Ina Sharples. So lots of people called me Ina or Enid. Mm -hmm. I got that for a long time. So a lot of people thought my name was Ina. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, what dish do you cook best? Is heating up a pizza classed as cooking? Because I, I do that know. really well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at pasta. I like making fresh pasta. Yeah. I don't do it all the time, but I love yeah. making fresh pasta. Well, that works. Mm -hmm. uh, your favorite character in any fictional story? Like oh, 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 Michael Scott in the US office. Mm -hmm. Hands down. That's what she said. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> the best character ever. Amazing. Love it. Yeah. Followed shortly by Davis in Schitt's Creek. I haven't watched it. Get out. Have you not watched Shit's Creek? It is amazing. <laughs> You've got time. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. I will. I, like, actually, I considered watching it at some point, and then for some reason, I chose something else, and then I... Well, more fool you. More fool you. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a lot of hours of good TV. In front of <laughs> uh, Star Wars and the Lord of the Rings. Neither. Do I have to pick? No. I don't like either of those films. No, okay, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> like yawn fest. <laughs> that was one of the wrong answers. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any unknown and unexpected talents? Um, my skipping. By the way, yes, I was so impressed because you starting, you know, to, to to upload those videos on Instagram with you skipping, Ooh. and it's like because I do boxing, you know, bo yeah, boxing yeah, yeah. for fitness, like, and you have to skip there, like, and it's it's hard, just just simple skipping for me. I mean, like, my my stamina is awful, but just in general, just just this for some people is very hard. But you do some tricks, and like this, this is so this amazing. Is... This is my one cool thing, so we'll have to come back to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, how often do you cry? Oh, quite a bit. Like, I'm really emotional. I'll watch a film, a sad film. I will cry every time. Like, yeah. I will cry at everything. Like, yeah. I'm super emotional. I, when I watch something, I'll be like, oh, God, that wife, that happened. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I cry a lot. Yeah. Right. I like a good cry. Yeah. Yeah. It's healthy, I think. People say that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, how can people reach you if they want to work with you? Instagram. Yeah. It's always the one. Mm. Slide into my DMs. <laughs> <laughs> you will have the link in the description. And finally, 
One cool thing, something that you really like and you think that people should try it too. So, as we just touched upon yeah. earlier, um, my one cool thing is my newfound love of skipping, mm -hmm. or jump rope, as apparently I have to call it now, like it's an American thing. Um, I absolutely love it. And this all came about from about four months ago, maybe. And I wanted to start doing some cardio because I hate cardio. I hate running. I don't like, I don't like cardio hit classes. I don't like any of that stuff. I love strength training. I love it. It's like really enjoy it. And I'm like, I need something. I need to do cardio. And then I started to follow this girl called Lauren. Lauren Jumps, she's called on Instagram. Billions of followers. And she's British, does all the skipping, does all these tricks. And I watched it. I'm like, oh my God, I want to do that. Mm. That's what I want to be doing. And so I bought a rope. And then I realized that was a really bad rope. There are bad ropes out there. I know. Um, and then I started buying some really good ropes and I got obsessed with buying ropes. And how, I got the can, mat can and I, ask, I got can everything. I ask, how expensive are, like how expensive is the range? How big is the range for, for the skipping ropes? Because it feels like anything that goes professional gets very extremely expensive to the degree that simple people who don't like are not in this, they don't understand. It. No, well, this is the beauty of skipping. It doesn't have to be expensive at all. Invest in a good rope and you will not have to keep buying ropes. 25 pounds is a good skipping rope. Which already is for some people could be like, for a fucking rope? That yeah, yeah, I yeah, could... yeah, but it's not just a yeah. rope and it's uh, and it's shatterproof and all this stuff because if it's hitting the floor constantly, yeah. that wears away really quickly. The handles are shatterproof because you will drop it if you're doing tricks and things like that. Um, I bought that. I've had a couple sent to me on Instagram. Um, so that's fair enough. But I've, I've found my one that I love. Mm -hmm. um, And then I bought a mat because the one thing I was doing wrong to start off with was Hard jumping floor. on concrete. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely smashed my knees up, like really bad, to the point where I thought, I've just discovered this new thing that I love doing, and now I can't do it anymore because my knees were agony. I couldn't walk up the stairs. I was in so much pain because I'd just overdone it. And um, so I had to take about two, three weeks off completely, rest up. And then I started back really steady, just doing 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And then I've built up and built up and built up. And now I go to the gym most days and do it. Yeah. And I love it. In fact, I was at the gym, this was yesterday. And this guy, as I was leaving, he was like, hey, were you, were you the girl doing the skipping? And I'm like, yeah. And he went, look, my daughter, she's just started doing professional tennis. Will you coach her skipping? And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, I'll pay you. I'm like, what? He said, would you, would you do that? Would you, do, would you coach her doing some skipping if like, I put you in touch? So I'm like, I won't take your money because I'm not a professional, yeah. but I will absolutely show her the ropes. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but I, just, I said, I will, I will happily show her the basics. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm learning myself. I yeah. can't teach other people while I'm still learning myself. But I know enough to go, yeah. do this and do this and do this and do this. I absolutely, it's changed my life. It has mm -hmm. absolutely changed my life. Like my fitness, everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's something that I just think anybody can do of any fitness level. And you can do it as basic as you want or as extreme. Or, and, you know, you can do all your skills and your tricks and things like that. And I've... I've taught Ross how to skip mm. and Piper, so we all skip together, which is really quite cute. Mm. Um, but just so good for your cardio and just—it's amazing, and it's so hard. So good, so hard. Because but when people, you get it right, it looks really slick. Because when you said like just 10 minutes a day, like some people don't realize how hard to oh skip God. for 10 minutes. Yeah, like I can, I can skip, I can't skip longer than a minute and a half without yeah. breaks. That's It's well, that's, just... that would be crazy if you could. So even though I've been doing it a while and I do it every day, I, I've got to two minutes solid where I can do it without a break. I time it every time. So I, I'll start skipping. It's usually a minute and a half to two minutes that, and then I'll stop. I'll have a pause. And then I start it. I only start the clock when I'm skipping mm -hmm. and I'll do half an hour. So I do 30 mm -hmm. solid minutes of skipping, oh my God. but that's over about 45 minutes. Mm. So start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. But the, um, the best thing about skipping is because I hate running. Mm. 10 minutes of skipping is the equivalent of 30 minutes running. It's hard. I know. It's, but you come away from it buzzing. Yeah. You're like, mm. 
I've learned this. Um, most of the time I've got my headphones on and I just feel like I'm dancing. I don't feel like, oh, this is an exercise and I've got to just do this for another 15 minutes or whatever. It's like I've, I, I'm make, enjoying myself. Mm. I'm learning these new things. And I'm, I get carried away with it all. Be like, oh, now I'm going to learn backwards or I'm going to learn these ebb swings or mic releases and all these. And that's the one that I'm learning at the moment where you let go of the mm -hmm. rope and you spin it twice and then you recatch it and carry oh, on skipping. And it's like, I can't do that. It's so hard. <laughs> it's great though. Because when you, when you master a skill and you can properly perform it then, you feel like an absolute legend. <laughs> Just mm. for a couple of moments. And, you know, back to reality, but still, it's so much fun. And like I said, anyone can do it. Anyone, you know, who is physically capable of jumping, give it a go. I would recommend it to absolutely anybody. Cool. Thank you very much. Oh my God, thank you, Thank Andre. you, it was so lovely. Thank you for having me here. And I really hope we'll have a chance to speak again at some point. I would love that. And maybe, maybe you'll have some big announcement. Who knows? Maybe like there is some news, like, or maybe you'll promote your feature film or whatever. And we'll talk again. Would love that. Next time, bring me a prize for the quiz. Next time, answer all the answers <laughs> right. <laughs> don't give me all this bullshit I don't like, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Mwah, you're you. welcome anytime, darling. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, let us know what you think about what we discussed. Do you have OCD? Do you have to deal with all the numbers? Or maybe you remember Jane from TV Times. Thank you. Bye.